All right, call to order the Planning Commission meeting of Thursday, February 7th. A uh, couple of housekeeping uh, items. If everyone could please turn off any electronic devices that may make noise. And if you could also fill out the green forms if you're planning on speaking tonight on any of the items. So first is any public comment. Oh, so establish a quorum. So let the rough record reflect that everyone is here except for Phoebe. And if we could have, if there's any public comments on items not on the agenda, now is the time. Go ahead. Do you have a speaker card? I did. I submitted the card. Eric. Okay, great. I'm Fred Halbensack. I live in Los Altos Square. We're a 77 uh, uh, home uh, condo association on 10 acres right behind um, Los, uh, uh, Whole Foods. And I'm the uh, HOA uh, board president. Um, I'm here because I want to give you a bit of a heads up. Um, there's a lot of interest in the residents in the North Los Altos El Camino neighborhood for a specific plan for our neighborhood to address some of the, um, the issues around the high density development that's going in and the low density residential that's directly abutting those new developments. Um, and that's, uh, if we are successful with the city council getting them to um, get this project going, um, I wanted to just give you a, a flavor of some of the issues that we're looking for your guidance and expertise to, to help us through working through some of these solutions. Um, the first one is essentially um, you know, mixed use in that area. That's a central element for walkability and creating a vision for a real vibrant neighborhood in that area. Uh, aside from that, we have two real specific issues we want to address. One is um, that we've seen developers at 4856, for example, El Camino, use uh, exemptions twice. We think that's not in the spirit of how the on-menu items were meant to be uh, used in the, um, the uh, density bonus ordinance. So that's something that we, should, we feel we need to correct. It's something that created a significant bulk to that building. And you can imagine if, uh, if a developer gets three or four exemptions, he could go to 100% reduction in, in the setback. So we think that's something that's easy to fix, and we'd like to advocate for that and find out how to do that. The second one is um, really addressing the residents um, fear of uh, fear of privacy invasion, where we have these large buildings that are next to um, low density residential, and there are a handful of, of, of uh, addresses I can give you of residents that are already impacted by this today. So on Long Jordan, along Sherwood Avenue, and in my area, Los Altos Square, we have four to five story buildings directly abutting uh, R1 and R3 residential. That and, and there's more coming. We see that coming. So this is a real fear the residents have. And we think that there's some simple creative things we'd like to throw out. For example, how do we identify certain uh, windows that are facing these residences that are, that are lower density? For example, maybe the minimum window height, window design, maybe recessed um, uh, balconies with, with appropriately designed parapets that would you know, prevent some of this fear of invasion of privacy. So that's the flavor of some of the things we'd like to put in front of you guys ultimately, and that's just a flavor. And we'd like to see your, uh, to, to be able to work with you guys in the future on this, uh, and we look forward to, to doing that in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Um, is that Thermi? Thermi Demis. Um, that's probably item. Are you you're speaking on the? Uh, there's no item number, so I just wanted to. I'm talking about the Arroyo change on the Arroyo. Yes. Okay. okay, item number two. All right. Okay, so we'll close. Oh. It's also the Arroyo. Okay. Um, and we will move on to Planning Commission minutes, approval of the minutes of the January 17, 2019 regular meeting. Does anyone have any I, I had uh, one um, comment I wanted to make on page four. Um, second paragraph is Commissioner Meadows noted blah, blah, blah. Um, I agree with all that. I also wanted to add that... Uh, Another sentence that said, uh, express concern that we already have one example where a pole has caused damage to a neighboring structure. 
or a story pole has caused damage. So, because we did have some discussion around that, and it will touch on it again later tonight. So, I just wanted to add that. And I just wanted to make a correction on the on item one. The minutes are for January seventeenth, twenty nineteen, and it's also further in the next paragraph there, where it says December sixth. They're from January seventeenth. Good catch. I can make a motion if there are no, uh, okay, so I move that we approve the consent calendar, which is solely the Planning Commission minutes from January 17th, um, with the additions or uh, corrections as noted. I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 One opposed? And I'm going to abstain because I was not here. So we will close that. And we'll move on to item number two, study session. Um, do we have a staff report? Yes. Good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Steve Golden, senior planner. Um, this is actually the second study session for the zoning text amendment for the R3 4.5 a multifamily district uh, there this is the second study session the first one was in September uh, where commissioners um, um, were requested to initiate the process per the code and then give some staff direction as far as how to move forward in the process and in writing um, a draft of the code and um, some desire to have some follow-up uh, sort of community input and so we decided to uh, draft that that ordinance we notified members of the community um, that were directly affected by um, that will be directly affected by the the zoning district amendment change and decided to have another study session to get more community input before it comes back to you as a as a public hearing item so just wanted to Hopefully not rehash too much for um, the planning commissioners that were present for the September meeting, but since there are um, 3D members, um, I'm sure that's open. So, um, so this is the the Marshall Meadows area. There's 48 homes um, in this um, R3 4.5 district. It's um, uh, it's bounded by Homestead on the south. And it's primarily the houses that are along Stevens Place and Marshall Court. Um, and then surrounding this neighborhood is um, single family houses, which are R110 um, zoning district. And if you looked at sort of the, the, the pattern of development, um, there, they are all duplex houses. Um, on these lots, the lots range from about 9,000 square feet up to 14,000 square feet. And if you look at the, the pattern of development, it's, it, it feels like single family homes. If you drive down the street um, and you're looking from the street, it looks like single family homes with slightly larger garages. There's three, three car garages that are either attached or detached. Um, but there are some units that um, are are flag lots, about half of the lots are flag lots. So they have sort of this extended driveway to the rear and um, shared, shared driveways. And then on the very um, eastern edge of the neighborhood, there's four of the 48 lots are two-story um, uh, duplex structures. And those are on a little bit larger lots and um, two, of those, two of those units back up to uh, the creek. This is a um, kind of a, a lot layout and has building footprints that this was submitted by the applicant, so this isn't something that staff developed. But this gives you an idea of the the orientation of the, the houses in the surrounding uh, neighborhood. Um, there were there was some input at the September 20th uh, planning commission meeting about the interface between the homes directly to the north. Um, there is a grade change 
Um, so the homes to the north sit lower than the Marshall Meadows neighborhood. Um, it depends on the lot, what the exact grain, grade change is. Um, but just want to make you aware of that. There has been some um, input regarding that, the, cha the grade change and um, sort of those potential impacts or perceived impacts that that might cause. Um, and if you look at sort of the, the placement of the structures on the lots, um, there's some regularity as far as the, the current setbacks. There's no rules for setbacks right now. That's what we're trying to establish. Um, but there's some regularity with regards to what, what, what might be perceived as a rear or kind of large si side yard and sort of the front yard orientation to the street. Um, but that also, there's some variation in that. So there hasn't been any survey level work done to actually measure out the exact um, um, setbacks that those structures have to, to, to lot lines. So um, sort, of to, sort of paraphrasing what the direction that I think overall that staff um, took from the September meeting was that you wanted staff to develop standards that don't create um, non-conforming structures. In a perfect world, that would be great. Um, and then also to protect the integrity of the Marshall Meadows neighborhood and the surrounding single family properties. So the whole the idea is to um, is to really uh, uh, protect the the neighborhood, but allow reasonable development um, of these lots um, where it's where it's appropriate. And you're you're developing or the the end result or the goal of of this is to develop um, those specific site development standards for this neighborhood. And when we look at this from sort of a public policy perspective, um, we kind of we start out with what we think is a, a good set of rules, and it's never going to um, it's never going to be perfect for every single lot. So when you gave some direction to create or to create a standards that you will never have any non-conforming structures, um, that's just very difficult to do unless you want to come up with a um, a plan unit development that addresses every single lot, all 48 lots. Um, when you look throughout the city, we do have a lot of single-family houses that are non-conforming, either in lot size setbacks, um, heights, it just happens that way. And so what the goal is to develop good public policy and, and codify those rules that um, are compromises in some ways. Some, some of the structures might have, might result in nonconformity, but there's a process in the code that staff has recommended um, that's very similar to how we, how we treat that with the R110 districts. And we did use R110 as kind of the base to develop um, the site-specific standards. Um, and then because these are duplex units and it is a multifamily district, we looked at the base of R110 and then we made modifications to that. So we tried to make it very reasonable to the surrounding um, R1 properties, but also um, give a little bit more flexibility because we're talking about duets, we're not talking about single family houses. So um, there is a little bit different expectation at least with those um, site development standards. So with that, um, there were some late correspondences that uh, were forwarded to the planning commissioners. I believe you have a copy there. Um, I'm sure you'll hear from community members as well. We expect that there's going to be input. Um, the, drafts, the draft ordinance is sort of a starting point, we hope. And um, so with that, um, I can take any questions that you might have. The quote unquote applicant who initiated this process has a, has a presentation. Um, and however you want to structure the study session um, is up to you. But anyone have any questions for staff? 
They do. <clears throat> um, where in, in the city are there examples of streets or neighborhoods where we limit um, limit it to one story? So there are one story overlay districts um, throughout the city. Um, I know there, where they where they exist. Um, we can probably pull up a map, um, the zoning map, but there are several throughout the city. Like uh, approximately, how many homes do you think in the, in the city? In or how many overlay districts are there? I believe there's ten or eleven overlay districts. They vary in size. Some are as small as six or eight properties. Others are larger and probably encompass, I think our largest one maybe encompasses 60 or 70 properties. So it's a small percentage of the overall properties in Los Altos. And um, the key um, and the important factor of a single story overlay is that it is property owner initiated. So right. each one of these overlays was initiated by that neighborhood. This wasn't imposed or adopted by the city. And what percentage of the neighbor ha neighborhood has to want that in order for that to go into effect? Um, in order to get um, to pass a single story overlay, at least um, two thirds plus one must vote in favor of the single story overlay. Okay. Um, um, can I add though, because uh, the R110 district and maybe other R um, districts don't allow two story on flag lots? That is correct. Yes. So I think that is very relevant to this discussion. <clears throat> Okay, and then um, the, where we have the difference in grade, um, like in a regular neighborhood, like I'm thinking of my street, my house is lower than both neighbors. What are the restrictions in terms of height? If someone, I mean, both my neighbors have two stories, so I'm trying to understand for everybody else where we have hilly streets with different grades. So the so the restrictions, there's no necessarily difference in restrictions in height because it's measured um, at that property. Um, but um, with regards to the, the two-story, um, if somebody were to propose a two-story structure, just like single-family houses um, or R1 districts, um, what how we structured it was that those would go to design review commission. There would be a public hearing, and um, and so there's a there's a different process for that to address those types of issues. Um, the grade change um, it hasn't changed. It's not like when this was built in 1961, um, the grade change was there when people bought their houses. This isn't a new revelation. It's it's been like that. The the idea about putting a second story, um, that would go through a, another discretionary review, and, that, and that's where we would address from a staff level, there are design review guidelines that, to guide that type of development. There's a public process, um, so those could, be, those could be addressed on an individual property by property basis. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, restricted throughout the whole district, but we could address that through um, initiated at when it's initiated on a property by property basis. And, and just to go a little further, design review doesn't have the ability to prevent someone from doing a second story, but they can. Um, or, and this is a question: they can, if there are issues of privacy or you know. Yeah. Make regulations about where the windows are and what they're facing and, and those kind of issues. But the, can they just say simply, even though someone is allowed, you can't do a second story? Um, they would be able to apply. It would go through this discretionary process to the Design Review Commission. Um, and at that, at that commission and from staff's perspective, we absolutely address privacy issues. Um, we do look at like window placement and sill heights to try to reduce the perceived impacts of of the privacy impacts, um, and and again address it on a project by project basis, just depending on um, what the issues are and figure out ways to potentially mitigate that through uh, plantings, um, you know, screening plant material, tall plants, um, and you know, address it that way. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, are any of the adjacent um, properties adjacent to, to these 48, are any of them on a single story overlay? Are there any nearby? No, so. So they can go two stories as well? Correct. Okay. That was the only question I had. Anyone else have any questions? I have a couple. Um, on this, so it's page two of two on attachment A, which I think is the proposed language. So second story <coughs> is being set set back, um, but it's only for, I guess, anything that has a ceiling height of five feet or greater, right? So presumably you could have a deck that goes all on the top of the first story that goes all the way to the same 20 feet. And we have addressed that through um, our guidelines. We've, we've addressed that, um, and the precedent has been to treat second story decks as a second story. And to and in the residential design guidelines, there are some pretty strong guidelines about um, privacy impacts if you had a second story deck and to, to to mitigate for that, and the, the uh, I'll just say that the commission is very, um, the current commission has addressed that on projects to really reduce the size of those terraces or decks to really um, minimize those impacts, and so that's something that we constantly are looking at. And, but it's defined the same way in those zones. In the R1 districts. Um, it, it has the same, this language is, I believe, the same in the R1 districts. Um, yeah, it is, and I, and I think if, if there is a concern, there, it could just be pretty clearly specified here that decks can, are considered a second story element subject to that. If, if there's concern that it's not clear. I wouldn't want anyone to think, I think this overrides anything else that may be. Definitely, and the goal with this language is if you have a second story inside a roof element, was to kind of provide guidance as to where that second story setback is measured from, not the outside of the roof, but where that wall is. But that can definitely be a clarification provided. Okay. Um, and in terms of just uh, <clears throat> the five feet, can you talk a little bit about where that came from? The 20 versus the 25, oh. and so the additional setback, is that similar to what you use in R1? So for R1 districts, um, the the side the side setback, the standard side side setback is 10 feet for the first story and 17 and a half feet for the second story. In the front and rear, it's just a standard 25 foot setback for, for first and second story. Again, it's a different district. It's multifamily, and so um, typically in multifamily districts, you have setbacks that reflect that type of development. So. Yeah, totally get it. Just so part so part of the was to was to um, to get some um, um, kind of art articulation from an aesthetic point of view so you don't have just a two story wall that goes up. Um, we would probably be addressing that through a design review anyways, but and then to to have that second story set back a little bit further because there are potential impacts with that. So. Okay. And then on C, the next clause, um, voluntary, voluntarily being rebuilt or replaced. Um, yeah. So, so, this, so this language is almost taken, it's taken directly out of the R1 districts. We did modify it slightly because we felt that um, if somebody wanted to modify one of the units um, that didn't have the nonconformity to, to bring everything into conformance, we thought was a little bit overreach. 
Um, so we gave, there's a little bit of flexibility in there looking at, um, at each unit and 50% replacement or um, um, removal of, of the square footage. We looked at it on a, on a sort of unit basis and counting the garage as a separate unit. There, there are, throughout this district, again, when you, when you try to develop this code and when you look at each lot, it's very difficult to say that everything's going to conform. But again, this is a process that's, that's carried out in the R1 districts as well. And so um, it's basically the 50% rule is um, looking at the majority of the structure. If you're, if you're rebuilding the majority of the structure, then we're going to say, hey, it all has to come into conformance. Um, Understood. I'm just trying to understand the, the, the intent, right? So if something burns down and you want to replace it, is that voluntary or involuntary? Can you build it back to where it was before? Are you grandfathered in, or do you have to? At that point, we do have provisions in our non-conforming ordinance that talk about that type of, uh, you have, if you lose a structure via disaster, there's certain provisions, but I, I believe even our non-conforming ordinance, if the structure's yeah, taken out entirely, it would have to come back into conformance. It's kind of a similar threshold if you, um, lose up to 50%, you can rebuild it as it is. If the whole structure is removed, then you wouldn't, you would still have to rebuild it in a conforming way. But the same would apply on this because the, our non conforming ordinance applies to all districts. Okay. And then <clears throat> if you remodel a home that was non conforming, if you're just doing interior work and upgrading electrical, mechanical, whatever it is. Yeah. So. When we talk about replacement square footage, we're looking at the structural components of the building. Um, and so if you're just doing interior remodel or um, it, even if you're taking out um, non-bearing walls or even bearing for that matter, um, we look at more of the whole, the, the structural components um, of the whole structure. Um, and so there's not necessarily an exact science to that, but we kind of, we have sort of methods developed to kind of look at that. And so, yeah, for non-conforming units, um, it doesn't, if somebody wanted to um, uh, remodel or even do an addition, the addition doesn't apply to that 50% because it's not the existing um, square footage, it's, that's all new. The new square footage would have to comply with the standards, but you wouldn't have to fix the the non-conforming. Okay. Anyone else have questions? I just wanted to clarify on that. So was the question whether or not voluntarily should be omitted in item C? It was it really just, just clear, like trying to understand the intent yeah. from staff. As I don't really have an opinion on, on it's whether the unit's being rebuilt. The the intent was to be as similar to the R one district sure. as possible, okay. and so Which we borrowed that language. Okay, okay. Even if it's probably yeah. <laughs> no. could be rewritten, but um, we're trying to go for similarities and uniformity. So. Understood. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it again, it is a good starting point, so we could modify that. Okay, and you mentioned that the applicant had had a presentation, and they have ten minutes. Is that right, Zach? Yes. Well, <clears throat> to the commission and the planning staff. We meet again, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, <clears throat> we applied. It's been a really interesting process because we really weren't supposed to apply because it's not our job to tell you to go tell staff to do something. But anyway, <clears throat> it got the process going. And uh, that's forward. Okay, thanks. So um, just a little bit of um, review. Um, this is the original track. When I first came to talk to staff, 
they said they weren't quite sure this maybe it had been inherited from the county or some such, and it was all kind of this strange little district. <clears throat> well, there's the original track recordings from the county, and it's um, January 21st, 1961, regular meeting of the Los Altos City Council. So um, there's the other half. They split it in two pieces, I think, to avoid the uh, subdivision rules, and uh, then subsequently in October they divided it again in three pieces, and that became what we now know as <clears throat> the Marshall Meadow and Marshall <clears throat> and uh, the Marshall Meadow II unit. There was just this one little problem, which is what caused all of this in the first place, which is that little line in red that says, as may be approved by the council after consideration of the report of the commission. And I had to change the slide, because last time I presented it was 57 years, now it's 58 years. <clears throat> so we move on. <laughs> um, we, have, we have some support. Um, just pointing out that uh, we sent out letters to all the owners and um, we got back the letters from 21 of the owners uh, without beating on their door, just sending them letters. So <clears throat> I'd say there was a pretty, pretty, a uh, lot of great stories about things that had happened where they didn't get to do what they wanted to do. And um, so anyway, fairly good response of people that <clears throat> said, yeah, let's go do this. Let's get this fixed. Um, obviously, this would bring clarity. The poor planning department doesn't like. I, I can tell you that when I walked in the door in <clears throat> May of 2017 and Zach happened to be on the desk and I said, gee, I really want to know what I can do with my duplex and he, or my, my house. I didn't say that. And he said, oh, yeah, what's the address? And he typed into the computer and got this terrible look on his face, turned around, grabbed this piece of paper and handed it to me and said, well, you really can't do anything. <clears throat> so that we're coming up on two years. Um, many homes will be non-conforming. I think the estimate that I have is about a quarter of them. Uh, we've done a little bit more work than the planning department is, and there's an awful lot of them built <clears throat> within five feet of the property line, especially the flag lots towards the front, and they just plopped them down pretty much <laughs> wherever they needed to, and they kept them, almost all of them, were inside the property line. There's one that's not. Um, Anyway, uh, <clears throat> we really don't want higher density than what we've got. Uh, the donors don't want anything mandated, so we don't have to go fix something. That's, I think, been addressed in this current draft code. We want to keep the neighborhood looking like it is, pretty much. Um, but we want to grandfather in what we've got. Uh, freedom to modernize, obviously freedom to update. If you go around the back side, um, and Cynthia on uh, El Cerrone, you know, there's some beautiful remodels. There's probably a quarter of the homes that have been remodeled over there. There's not a one on our street that's on either side that's been remodeled. <clears throat> Most of the discussion you will hear, I have no doubt, will be about two stories. Um, that's what we heard last time. Um, the R110 homes adjacent to Mountain Meadow are allowed to, to do remodels. Four of, as... Um, Steve said uh, four of the Mountain Meadow development homes were originally built as, as two stories, and three of the R110s that border this district are already two story. And there's a map of all the two stories in the neighborhood. As you can see, the one, um, just a point or two, by any chance? No, it doesn't work. Anyway, the one just to the, to the north of the unit on the right hand side, that borders uh, uh, the um, R3, 4.5, and the two on the left there border it, and then there's a bunch more over there. So there's plenty of two stories running around. So I guess what I would say is uh, I've gotten lots of input from the neighbors, some who don't want anything to change, some that would like to do something right now, some that think two stories is not good, but everything else is great. Um, some more stories about people who've tried to remodel. I think the important thing here is we need to get a, a code so that <clears throat> there's clarity in what to do. I think the biggest single thing that I see on the current draft is this one that was brought up, Section C, that was the, um, I bring it into conformance. There are certain properties, um, as it happens, mine would be one of them, which is 15 feet to the back setback um, instead of 20. 
So if we do more than 50% remodel on unit B, then we'd have to move that entire wall in. Um, not quite clear what that means, 50%. And I think uh, I had a long discussion with my architect about that, and he says, that's going to be a tough one to figure out what that number is. How do you, if we take the roof off of them, these are all uh, gabled roofs, if we put a flat roof or we put a shed roof over the top, um, to lower the profile, does that 50% if we do it over the whole unit? Um, things like that are going to be com confusing. So now if we add space, which is our goal, we could go up or we could fill in the courtyard or we could go out to the, the setbacks. Uh, it doesn't change the texture of the place very much if you fill in the courtyard. You don't even know it's been done. And there's about three or 400 square feet in most of these courtyards. And if you go out a little bit farther on the side setbacks, these houses are about 50 feet deep. You got five feet, you got 250 square feet you just added. We're going to run into the coverage before we run into any problems with <clears throat> um, you know, sides and backs and things. If you have the setbacks, these are small lots, and you have to have the extra setbacks for the second story, that's fine because there's plenty of space in there to get another story in on top and be set back, and the impact, the slight site planes, the massing, would be very uh, minimal in that neighborhood, as you can see from some of the ones that are already two-story. So I think just a consideration that we not make the rebuild or the remodel too onerous, because I think this neighborhood could use some remodeling. I think these houses are the ones on uh, Cynthia and El Serrano and stuff are $3 million houses. These are $3 million houses. They're all very comparable. I think it would be good if we had the ability to remodel and we could get going on sort of upgrading the neighborhood, if you like. And the second story will be an issue. But again, if you don't want non-conforming, well, that's a problem. And the R110s can do it all around if they choose. And we have the setback. So I give you two minutes back to the chairman. Thank you very much. I have a question Any questions? for the applicant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could you go back um, to the page that showed the neighborhood with the little red dots? Sure. Could you uh, leave it the on other that? Side, right? Oop, oop. right there. Yeah. <laughs> so you I'm said that there. about 25% of the homes are non conforming. Yeah. What, in what way are they non conforming, and approximately where are they? So there are houses, uh, the, this one, for example, is built right on the property line. Okay. And this one is built right on the property line. On the back side. This one is built right on the property line, as is this one. So if you go along, it's mostly these flag lots that are really close in, and they, a lot of them are fine. You know, so, so you're saying Could you go flag, back to the mic the flag, now? The flag lots are non-conforming towards the homes on the south as opposed to yes. the homes we're, in the north? We're going to need you to step right. back to the mic just because there's people at home that won't be able to hear you. Yeah, Thank you. That's right. I think that it's, it's non-conforming to the south, typically. Got it. So none of those homes on that northern perimeter border are non-conforming that they're too close to their, to their right. neighbor. Right. So yeah. let me just interject, though. A lot of times people don't know they have a non-conforming <laughs> issue until they do a survey and they realize the fence <laughs> is off by a foot. Right. Or six inches and they think that that's the property line and it's not um and so that's why you know unless you had a survey quality information for every single lot it's hard to you can kind of guesstimate maybe a quarter but it could be more or less than that but if you look at those that line of homes it's a straight line from the back of those homes presuming presuming they were built where they were drawn and the distance is accurate. So but it's not as obvious as the instances where you see the, the property going all the way up to the line. Yeah, and it's obvious non-conforming. And I'll just say that this is from the applicant, and I think their architect used um, like Google aerial photos and tried to fill, tried to draw lines around that. So it's not a perfect science. <laughs> just, just trying to. Yeah. We suggest we, that don't analyze the the site plan too much because it's just yeah, a it's a representation. It's not a survey for sure. We did use the other um, maps for the set. We we do 
<clears throat> used Google to put them on, but the property lines were taken from the uh, county recorder survey maps. Thank you. Could we keep this up so that when people speak, we can get a sense of where their where their location is? Sure. Any other questions? I do. If you could actually go to the one that had the 21 out of the 46 that the green. The, uh, yeah, you drive, yeah. Steve. Yeah. Um, and so, this are the 21 owners that have signed letters of support. Did you get any letters of non-support? No, we did not. We sent out a letter. I mean, <clears throat> we, I think we provided the copies to um, to the planning department, but we basically <clears throat> stated we were planning to remodel. We had gone to the planning department. We found out we couldn't. Here's the situation. Um, are you in favor of us <clears throat> proceeding with uh, a code amendment? to get a code for the neighborhood. And we sent a copy of the <clears throat> R3 4.5 as it existed, and we drew a draft up uh, that we provided to planning of what we thought an R3 4.5 amendment should look like. And we sent them that, which is pretty comparable. We worked off of um, the R3 1.8, which is a multi-unit near downtown over here in the corner and R110 so we kind of merged those and I think we weren't we weren't significantly different than what you've proposed does anyone else have any questions to, to follow up on this one uh, was there a correlation between the green um, homes the, the owners that you heard from are those owner occupied so those are the owners who are living there or is there no correlation in there there is um, some correlation there were more owner occupied that sent in letters than there weren't, but it was probably only about ha about. Eh, I don't know. I could look it up, but okay, so we have we have it on the data. We have a database, a, and it's yeah, out there. But it, it wasn't That's highly fine. correlated. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This I have. This raises two questions of staff. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. Can I? I don't know when is yeah. the right time to do it. But I have, so in fifty-eight years, does this mean that nobody has remodeled? I mean, with the building department, planning department's blessing, anything in this area? So, or if they did something internally, then it would they would go through the if they wanted. Yes, yeah, so I think there's been I think some action. confusion because I've seen it in emails about um, there is building code. Some people have said they can't believe there hasn't been any building code for so many years, but there is building code, the California Residential Code. It's, um, but the zoning. Uh, there's no site development standard, so I don't know if there. Probably Paul can tell you if there's been any additions in that time period, um, but I think minor, if that, not total rebuilds like other places in the city. It does not appear that there's any additions that have ever been approved out there because of this limitation, <clears throat> and not a significant number of building permits, but there have for interior work. I mean, you could, under the current code, you could do interior remodeling, you could do rewiring, um, you could do window replacement. You just can't expand the envelope of the structure in any way. But yeah, there there haven't been a lot, but there have been some building permits issued over the year, water heater replacements, a lot of more standard maintenance type of permits. And, and those the, this code doesn't prohibit those from proceeding. And that 50% um, language where if they do more than 50% to the, to the residents, they have to conform, that is consistent. I, I mean, I'm familiar with that language, with what we apply to with, everybody else mm -hmm. throughout the city. So while they may not be familiar with it, you can explain to any resident what that would entail, or their architects. Yeah, Correct. and it's the 50% is if you're, if you're rebuilding the majority of the structure, then the concept is, well, then you can conform to the standards. Under 50%, you can keep it non-conforming, but if you're going to make that large of a, an improvement to the property, then you should conform at that point. It's not an easy one to tell somebody at the counter or I'm sure at the accepting end, but that's the rules that have been in place for a long time. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, I had a question for the applicant, actually. Uh, of the 21 owners that so have signed letters of support, is there, is there a sort of universal support for two-story two homes? I would say not. Okay. There are some people <clears throat> that are in favor of getting a code but 
not in favor of two story. And what could you give us a little breakdown or no, I don't have I mean I only know of two people that have said they weren't they liked it but they weren't really in favor of two story. Okay. Out of twenty. But I have no idea because you know, our communication is kind of one direction mostly. <laughs> we think it was um, pretty pretty awesome that we got 21 letters back yeah. on two mailings and almost of them came on the first mailing. So, Thank you. I, sorry, I had a quick question for the applicant. Um, you said you, you had spoken to an architect. Uh, did he mention how much your home, if you followed the setbacks that are proposed here, without adding a second story, how much you could add to your current? Because I think all the homes are pretty much the same size. They're all about 2,200. All about 2,200, and they all have, they vary quite significantly in the garage space. Uh, okay. Most of the ones that face onto the street are three car, not all. Some are two car garages. Some in the back, there's um, one with one car and a carport. There's a whole variety in the in the flag lots. Okay. Um, so that varies then in terms of footprint between <clears throat> maybe 400-something square feet and, and six-something. Uh, if you fill in the courtyard, which doesn't do anything except coverage, doesn't take the uh, setbacks, you the gain... The courtyard, you mean behind the garage? Sorry, yeah. So each of these, and they, they vary significantly, but the majority of them have a garage that's a separate unit, but it's yeah. connected by a roof. Okay. And so if you then walk through the breezeway, you walk into a courtyard that has entrances to both the A and B units. Okay. If you were to take those and change that and, and utilize that space, it varies between 300 and 500 square feet, depending on the, how they laid it out. Okay. And so you can do that just by doing that. So basically ours for example we're about 2200 square feet and about six something on the garage so we're at 28 so we'd have 1200 square feet a little less on our 40 percent coverage mm. which we could easily do uh, just moving one of our setbacks out we could pretty much come close to gaining that on, on both sides i see okay thank you one additional question and how much square footage would you lose on the setback where you need to conform I think it's not the footage loss that would be important, it's the cost. So on unit B, for instance, in our particular case, our unit A is 24 feet from the back line. And we've had a survey, so ours, ours has been surveyed. <clears throat> the unit B is 15 feet. So to hit the 20 feet, we'd have to move that entire wall, 50-some feet of building, back five feet to remodel, which would be prohibitive, and we, we just wouldn't do it. So it isn't the square footage, it's the cost. To, I mean, there's a bathroom there, there's a kitchen there, and there's a bedroom there on that back wall. And so. But just to clarify, it's not to remodel. You wouldn't have to move that wall to remodel, right? No, especially under the, co the way it's written now, if we didn't redo the B unit. But if we wanted to take that courtyard and reutilize it, then we would move the B unit's door to the side, integrate the garage in the house, fill in the courtyard on both the A and B side. It would be a little hard to explain without seeing it, but it basically moves the doors out to the edge, fills in the space, and connects the garage directly to the house. And so <clears throat> that would be potentially more than 50%, but we would want to take the roof off and put a flat roof on. Right. But you that said that that was three or 400 square feet of courtyard that you'd be filling in. Yeah. Which seems like it would be less than 50%. Well, I'm not sure, actually, when they said that, whether they were counting the additional square foot or only remodeling of the square feet we have. So unit A, for instance, is 1,200 square feet. If we remodeled more than 600 of it, then we have to redo it. But what if we added the 300, 400 square feet in the courtyard to it? So I want to caution, and staff, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't really want to get too much into the specifics of this one thing. We're mm -hmm. looking at the the yep. whole uh, development, so exactly. I'd, I'd suggest we move it on maybe to public just, comment, or do you want to clarify? I was just I trying just, to clarify yeah. between remodeling and adding. And maybe right. just for everyone's yeah. clarification, a remodel is exactly that, a remodel. A rebuild mm -hmm. is when you're literally tearing it down to the subfloor. Right. A remodel isn't triggering any percentage. A 
rebuild, where you're tearing down the subfloor to rebuild the structure, that's when you're triggering the 50%. And addition doesn't trigger it either. So we're looking at if you've got an existing 1,200 square foot unit, you add 600, 700 square feet onto it, you're still maintaining that existing unit. See, it's 50% of that existing unit that then triggers it. So just thinking of those thresholds, anytime the term remodel is used, that's not going to trigger it. A rebuild is what will trigger it. Perfect. So with that, we're going to move on to public comment. Um, I'm going to call three people so that everyone knows where, where you are in line if you get ready while the okay. current speaker is speaking. Are we going two or three minutes? Um, I've got six cards. Some um, are on the next. Steve, can you go back I, to the image with the red no, dots in case people are outside the neighborhood? This one's over. Oh, that's 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 the that's one that are speaking. One so we're going to do three minutes, Zach. Um, what, what was that? I'm sorry. Three minutes. Three minutes. Perfect. It's only five speakers. Um, so first one is Eric Dietrich. Terry Wiss, and then Carl Hansen. All right, thank you uh, for having us here. Um, my name is Eric DeFries. I live on Louise Lane, which is uh, just north of this development, um, kind of on the corner there. So I back up to a couple of these. Um, I think a lot of my concerns are around the height difference. So I think already I would say that lot is maybe four feet higher than mine. So it's already. A little bit of a privacy issue if if they did extend up to you know the full two story at the current setback I think that would be a real privacy issue I don't and also I don't think there's a, a great way to mitigate that as it is now um, the other concerns I have are if if we did approve this as is and allow people to kind of build out to this code I I really do think it would change the feel of the neighborhood like we bought here a couple of years ago and you know it looked like an R1 district right I know it was townhomes and that's fine um, if this was all two-story and they're all built, you know, I think is it five, ten feet from the property line internally? Um, you know, it would almost feel like apartments, right? It would, it would feel a lot higher density. Um, and I think if we did allow people to, you know, add, you know, I think on a 9,000 square foot lot, if they did the 40% floor ratio, that's, that's 3,600 square feet. I mean, that's a good amount of uh, square footage. Um, that's going to bring more people to the neighborhood, however we spin it. Um, so I think parking... Uh, traffic right there at Fallen Leaf and Homestead where um, if you look on next door there's I think a six page long thread about all of the traffic problems there um, numerous people hit uh, students pedestrians so I don't think we should really do anything here unless we're going to address that whether it's a stoplight whether it's something else um, I, I don't think that they should be separated I think that's an important issue um, and I really would like to see us address the lot height difference in the coding as opposed to making every one of the, the 10 people that kind of border this have to fight that individually down the road. Um, because I think it is, you know, it is a big difference and it's not something that, um, you know, I mean, even if you looked at the code and came down to the city and did all your diligence, it would not have said that they could build two stories there, right? And if you drove through the neighborhood, you would not see a two-story building there. I know there are some down at the end there, but there are much bigger lots. They're secluded by trees. Um, and you can drive right to that cul-de-sac and you won't even notice that they're two-story. Um, so I think, I think really, you know, the look and feel of the neighborhood is one story. Um, and I think there's even, you know, a lot of feeling of the people that live there, not just the owners that, you know, may not even be in the neighborhood, but the actual people that live there, um, they want to kind of keep it that way. So I don't know if we should give people the opportunity to vote on a single-story overlay, if that's something that they can have, um, but I think it's worth considering. So thank you. Terry was. Hi, I live on Fallen Leaf Lane. I'm the first one to the north on the right-hand side. Um, and I go back and I look at things like the Los Altos General Plan um, and pull information from that. And I think um, all of us that um, are in the single-family homes are, are concerned about the density issue. Um, the traffic there, I invite anyone to come during the morning or the evening rush hour and see how backed up Homestead is trying to get in or out um, during either rush hour time. 
um, under the community design and historic resources element of the Los Altos um, general plan, it says community design, established low density residential neighborhoods, many having streets without sidewalks, predominantly low profile single story structures throughout the community. Goal one says preserve and enhance the identity and unique character of Los Altos. Policy 1.5 says continue to protect the privacy of neighbors and minimize the appearance of bulk in new homes and additions to existing homes. Policy 1.7, the last part of it says compatible in the context of the surrounding neighborhoods. Policy 1.8, consider neighborhood de desires regarding the character of future development. Communities uh, design uh, community identity and character, number one, says maintaining the low density, low profile residential character of the community through zoning regulations and design guidelines. Um, I have significant concerns about doing a case-by-case -case basis once things get into design. Um, the four homes uh, that do currently have the two-story also back up to the creek. So it's not like there's somebody immediately behind them to have to worry about that. And so I feel like saying that there are already some existing two-story structures doesn't really, um, it isn't fair because theirs is a different situation than the rest of those. Um, also under the uh, page five of the land use plan and policy map, it does designate this as a low density multifamily um, area. And so um, it just gets back to that anything that's going to go higher, um, significantly more square footage. I don't have a problem with the, with the courtyard idea. I mean, that, that totally is within sort of what, what they already have going on there. Um, but when we get into the two-story, it just seems like you automatically are bringing more density, more traffic, um, and less of the existing feel of the neighborhood. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Carl Hansen. I appreciate all of your time and what you do. Um, I actually just want to make a couple of very simple comments. Um, I remember in 1960, I came here with my father when the developer wanted to put this project in. I'm joking totally, but the point is, if you look at it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that they put in a very high density neighborhood that's unique to the entire town. Also, I hope when I, I was a little concerned when, when the pr proposal, well, we're going to put a flat roof. If you've been to this community, they all have very unique roof lines that don't exist anywhere else in the city. Are you aware of that? The slope of the roof and whatnot. So it's, it was a planned community from the get-go, and I think that disrupting it, it got its special zoning because it was a planned community that way. And it's already very high density. I'm the one that sent the photographs of the parking situation. The entire block is parked in, and there's a ton of traffic that comes through these two streets because of the number of cars that are there. I hope you had a chance to look at this photograph specifically. This is the top of my legal roof line right here. And you can see how high my neighboring house is. It's ginormous. It's just towering over us. So. I'm concerned that, first of all, that we need to disrupt the community with new roofs and whatever. It seems illogical. But because it is on a ridge, and the, the important note is the two stories on the far right, they are indeed falling away towards the creek. Just, and, and that's the point. That's why they're not nearly, and plus they're A-frame two-story houses, if you know what I mean by that. So they're not your typical towering two-story. Anyway. Um, there's a lot to be said from other people, so I'll be brief. Thank you. Nateen, Nateen, then Emily. Hi there. Uh, I'm from 1682 Stevens Place. I uh, think I support the proposal. One concern I have is around 20 feet offset from our 110 district. So our unit is Unit A, which is 1,200 square feet, uh, and we are planning to stand that either second story or it's another way. Uh, I think that our house is like 14 feet off seat from R110. And we are planning to, and it seems like 
data, I think, look at, if, look, if you look at the language, it says we want to accommodate and make sure non-conforming properties as many as possible. But it seems like the commission hasn't considered all the properties. They haven't done any survey. Um, they, I'm, I'm personally willing to volunteer for survey, so I, I, I basically recommend that they should ask people to, you know, provide some data that where, where what are their uh, boundary lines uh, so that, you know, they should be able to build a new house, um, you know, 50% or more and uh, up, for, up to 40% and touch the 50% build. But at the same time, they shouldn't be forced to move the existing boundaries. Forcing them to move the existing boundary will be very non-economical. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons we, people have these multifamily houses are, you know, they are economically uh, feasible. Uh, you know, the families who cannot afford single family houses in the, this area. So uh, I think they should also consider that they should ask people to do the survey and collect enough data. I mean, it seems like 20 feet is right now biased with various factors. And if you say that 14 feet uh, non-confirming right now is fine as long as you don't build, uh, that's okay. But if, when you want to build, you're saying that it should be 25 feet on the second story. So that doesn't fit right there. So I feel that there's not enough data. They should collect more data. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed North and Michelle Machado. Uh, good evening. My name's Ed North, and I live over on Cynthia Way. Um, and I, uh, my property adjoin or abuts. See, I live right right here, and there are three units. Three duplex units uh, behind my property. Where, where are you pointing? Oh, this point. You see that? There's. Mm -hmm. Tell us what street you live on. Speaks, so Stevens. Place. There we go. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay. So, um, and as you know, the uh, there's a grade uh, both to the east. As you go towards Stevens Creek, it goes down, and as you go north towards Fremont Avenue, the grade goes down as well. So, as a result, uh, my house is a little bit lower. In fact, I, I measured it's about nine feet lower than the duplex grade um, above me. So already that duplex is like a two-story house to me. It's pretty high. And uh, as you can see also, I face our backyard faces south. So most of the year there's quite a bit of shade, and this time of year there's a lot of shade in our backyard. So a second story on top of that duplex would put us pretty much in the dark. So um, I guess what I would recommend or what we would hope to see, uh, a couple of things. One is that we would you would consider the grade differential um, when you're thinking about height requirements for these uh, duplexes over on Marshall Court and Stevens Place. Um, another, um, I noticed that in the R1 R10 code for flag lots, they're limited to 20 feet or um, one story. And that would certainly be uh, something that we'd like to see on, um, in the new R3 uh, 4.5 code. So those are the kinds of things that uh, we're looking at. Again, it's a height issue for us, and uh, we have invited some of the uh, people to come out and take a look in the neighborhood, and we'd like to extend that invitation again. But you're going to have to knock on the door because based on the recommendations of our police department, our side, side gates are locked. So um, knock on the front door, and we'll be happy to show you around the neighborhood. Thank you. Hi. So I live right next door to Paul and Lenore on the north side of them. So. I have the same issues about the density and the parking situation and the cars. I got off on Foothill Expressway tonight. It took me 20 minutes to get to my house because of the number of cars that are trying to get onto Homestead. So it's a huge issue. Um, I got some, basic, some other curious questions. What is meant by small family daycare up here in permitted uses? Everybody's talking about the two family homes and two stories. I'm against two stories. But what does false ma false small family daycare mean? Can anybody might, tell me? You might want to use your time to finish your point and then ask that at the end. Okay, well, your time my, my other specific point is about what is net lot area mean? Because of the easement issue on my side of the house, if the 40% is allowed on the actual property size based on the map. You're going to have a lot bigger house than you think because their actual eff effective property that you can actually walk around and stand on is 1,000 feet smaller. So I don't know what net lot area means, but 
I don't want somebody to be able to build on the south side of my house right up to the fence line because of the non-conforming property line issue there done by the developer 40, 50 years ago. So can anybody tell me what net lot area means? So this is an opportunity for you to tell us all of your concerns. It's not really a conversation, but okay. if you have questions, you well, can Well, that is my concern. To, my concern yeah. is about, you know, that these setbacks are based on effective area, not actual property lines, especially when there's a non-conforming problem. And I'm not going to repeat all the stuff about the second-story homes. I agree with everything that everybody said in the negative about those. I won't bore you with any more of it. But is that clear what I'm, my concern about that, you know, my neighbor's property is smaller than the actual map? You know, if it's not based on their actual buildable, then if it's done, written that way in the code, somebody could build their, that house, whether it's them or the people who come after them, literally right up to my property line. Which is your property? Is at the very, very corner? To this one right here. Got it. And here's Paul Lindor. I wouldn't want that to happen. I don't really have any other concerns other than the density, the private, all the other concerns that people said about negative about two-story homes. I don't want them either. But I also don't want somebody to be able to build up to my property line. And I don't think I have anything else. So how, what is the proper way to address these things? I wanted to know what met, is meant by small family daycare. What's meant by net lot area? Do I write a letter to Steve? Do I call him up? I mean, what's the way to find that out? We can answer those pretty quickly. So small family daycare, um, per the state of California, it's, it's, um, it's a permitted use. Um, we can't exclude that. Um, the setback measurements are from the actual property lines. It's not based on the, where the existing unit is. The setbacks are always measured from property line to the um, exterior wall or structural support of the, of the building. And then with regards to net lot area, um, there I think was a, a discrepancy in the code, the draft code. So on page one under section 14.16.060, um, our intent was to apply the floor area ratio to gross and not net because there's a, the majority of these parcels have a large area that um, uh, is either an easement, uh, ingress, egress easement, um, or other, t other type of easement. So um, we do use net for R1 districts um, where you don't have these types of easements that impact nearly every lot. But so in this district, our intent was to um, was to use gross and not net. We did modify that language after the first draft was um, um, posted on the website. Um, so that was just kind of a, a thing that we caught not not very well. I, I would uh, confess. So does it, are you saying then that because of that, if somebody wanted to build up to my fence line, they'd be allowed to do it? Three minutes up. Yeah. How do I, so how do I solve it? Can do I call this. him? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> but again, real quick, setbacks are always measured from property line. Understood. Yeah. If there's, that's the last speaker card that I have on this. So if there's no one else, we're going to close public comment and uh, open it up. Um, I can, and it's it's worth pointing out that this is a study session, so this is not even. Um, I mean, it's an attempt at a draft to give us something to hang some uh, meat around for it to <coughs> then potentially come back uh, for work on uh, looking at what it might look like as zoning. So you have many more chances um, to come and enjoy our company, or we will enjoy your company. <laughs> so we look forward to that. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to give uh, s some comments and some impressions. That's what we tend to do in the study sessions, because then they can take that and come back with it. Um, and some of it will be questions. So this will look a little bit more like a dialogue between us and staff as we, as we work on this uh, with you all. 
um, listening. Lucky you. Um, so the one thing I didn't see, and I think is just sort of the first top-level question is, are these lots required to stay as duplex or two units? Yeah, so under permitted uses, the only, I should say the only use, but the first one under A, so 14-16-030, it's the permitted use is a two-family dwelling. So you cannot knock down the two-story, the two-family dwelling and build a single-family house. Okay, that's not how I read that, because I, I have that highlighted, but to me it was ambiguous. It says with not more than one two-family dwelling. It doesn't say less than well, it doesn't say maintain. It doesn't say two fa a two-family dwelling. It says not more than one. That's not the same thing. Well, it does say the permanent use is a two-family dwelling unit with not more than one. Two two okay, so you're saying that first part of the clause, two-family dwelling units with not, with not more than one two-family dwelling. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that then... Is may or may not be explicit to all of us, but we are explicit. We are meaning that this will codify that no one can take their two A and B units and turn that into one dwelling unit. Is that correct? Legally, they cannot. If this, if whatever we enact says this, <laughs> correct and. I mean, the z existing zoning we could take a look at, but I think that's even in the existing zoning for that district. Yeah, I mean, we could take away the second part if you just want it to be crystal clear, two-family dwelling units. But, yeah, the, the intent of this is to pr uh, maintain Preserve, that condition yes. and, and not right. allow for a single-family dwelling to come in. Right. And I think that, you know, whatever <clears throat> way to make it most clear, because uh, I heard a lot of concerns about density, and there's really no... Um, in a, in, you know, there's no real um, reason for density to increase. You're, you're talking about two family dwellings, and they may be larger, um, but they're, it's not going to become three family dwelling units, and nor would it become one family dwelling unit is what you're saying, too. So, yeah. so we're saying we're going to keep it as two family dwelling units. All right. And that's, and that's the same as the current code. Okay. Um, for that district. So then uh, we're in the um, table, page one of two of the, the draft. Um, you give a lot of uh, potential setbacks. I must admit, like a few people mentioned in the audience, uh, um, I feel a little at a loss without being able to see what some of these setbacks represent now. Because um, to me, um, 30 feet, 20 feet, is that whether I know they're not consistent, but are they in the range of 18 to 22 feet? Or, you know, are these, these sounded like they might be kind of big setbacks, particularly depending on how we go with the two-story piece. But I understand you're not going to necessarily go out and survey the whole neighborhood, but I think it'd be nice to have a gauge as, you know, what is that um, Marshall Court setback on the south side? What is it on the north side? And approximately, what are the ranges? Because it's very hard for me to have a good sense of whether that 20 feet or 30 feet is the same, less, more, you know, so so that's a little difficult. I think there was something in the staff report about the 30 feet being a result of um, an mm -hmm. easement. Yeah, the 30 feet is a... It's kind of required. Yeah, There's because on mm -hmm. fallen, fallen Leaf, uh, there is a, um, a public um, service easement for the high power voltage lines. So that right, okay. is not going to go away. So okay. that's why we established 30 feet, um, uh -huh. just to kind of codify that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we we primarily used the, the R1 standards and and kind of took a, took a look at that as the, the base and looked at right. the existing houses. Yeah. and. Right. Uh, I, I know. I heard all that. But it would just be mm -hmm. helpful to see sort of the range of where they're sitting now because... Again, the R110. So I'm going uh, to tag on to that then, the R110. Um, as we discussed already, um, flag lots in R110 are not allowed to be two-story with our current zoning. They were at some points in the past. Um, they haven't been for probably, what, at least 10, 12, 
15, 15 even, yeah, in that range. So, um, to me, if we're if we're trying to model off R110, which makes sense in in some in many respects, um, then the two story, then really this this neighborhood is almost 50 percent flag lots. We don't have that anywhere else, and so I don't know why we'd have. Uh, we have flag lots scattered here and there, but nowhere near this um, level of, uh, mm -hmm. again, it's almost half the homes are flag lot. Almost all of them are, are flag lot set up. So if we're modeling off our 110 in terms of our setbacks, then, then we need to think about what does that mean in terms of two stories. We wouldn't be allowing two stories in the back uh, flag lots, if you want to call them that. Um, but then there's the whole level of fairness. I mean, is it really fair to allow the people in the front to have two stories, but the people who um, are in the back don't have two stories? So, Particularly where the, the people in the back are facing Homestead. Yeah, I mean. The, where's the harm? Where's the. Well, and maybe, yeah. So, so to me, it's a whole tricky. I mean, we can talk about R110, but there's really, I'd be more inclined to look at loosening the setbacks but keeping it, um, I mean, I don't see how we can have two stories in things that are essentially flag lots if we're using R110 to derive the analogies we're making for this district. So if I could respond yes. to that. So with regards to flag lots and R1 districts, um, the flag lot standard is is currently um, a one-story restriction, but those lots are also, the minimum lot size is 15,000 mm -hmm. square feet, so you have a lot more to play with. Um, the flag lots also, because of the relationship um, to the surrounding houses, um, that's also uh, why the one-story was applied. In, in this development, the, the impacts of the flag lots are mostly within the the district so they're mostly felt within the district and then those flag lots so along the northerly um, boundary um, those are mostly what we would call rear like a rear yard r relationship and so <clears throat> the standard that we applied is equal to an r1 standard the second story is 25 feet from the rear property line that would, that's the same as an R1 district. So You mean a non-flag lot? Um, yes, sorry, a non-type non of flag lot. But then R1 you district. have two 25-foot setbacks, so you have 50 feet in between them. Um, mm -hmm. Right, which would be similar to the R1 to the north in this situation. Oh, to the R1, yes, but not to the front and back of these units. Yeah, so... so Part of my response is if you're looking at how the how the second story impacts, I think it's more impacting um, within the develop within the neighborhood rather than the surrounding R1 district. There there is the issue with the grade element, um, and those just like R1 districts, we evaluate those on a project or parcel by parcel basis. Um, again, that grade change has always been there, so it yeah. we we just address it that way. And people, when these projects come in and there's these grade changes, um, it it's just part of part right. of living. Well, it. and I I agree with you. I don't, and I know some people out here won't be happy. I, the topographic argument is is not to me the 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 strong argument it's not valid you go to the highlands neighborhood in los altos around montclair elementary school there's houses that the grade changes there are massive and you have houses almost right on top of each other and that's the way the topography is and and has mm -hmm. been um so but to me it's more the you know if, if you're trying to model this off of um you know r1 and flat uh flag lot considerations I don't see how you with a with flag lots. Um, if you had two stories, as you're saying, the impact is only on the, the the house in front of it, but that's still an impact. So, I mean, the the intention, and I'm kind of belaboring this because it was on design review, and we faced um, a lot of this. And sometimes people ask for variances to put two stories on flag lots, but the intent was that 
lots behind the lots at the front of the street would not have two-story houses. And um, What was the rationale? And Well, the design review didn't put that in place, so I don't know what the city's rationale at the time, but was it was presumably to um, improve um, privacy impacts and, and not have mass right in your backyard. I know what you mean about, so those are 15,000 square foot lots that are flag lots, but most of that is, um, that's the gross. Most of that is the driveway, and so the lots aren't necessarily that much bigger. Lots are 15,000 square foot net, so it excludes the flag. Net? It's not gross? It, yeah. Gross more 18, okay, I, th I thought it was the other way around, but Anyway, but these are not. I mean, these are 9,000 for the, the duplex, right? So you're talking about 4,500 square feet. You know, I don't know. And, and I think maybe um, to kind of talk about it but not get mm -hmm. too bogged down in it, it's a question to consider whether it's inappropriate. I, I think looking at it, two stories are allowed um, around the city. so. Is that something you would want to exclude from this district or not, um, or selectively allow? I, so I think it's more of a discussion point. I mean, I think we modeled after um, single fam um, a single family district where their two stories are allowed. Um, if if you, your feeling is that shouldn't be, that's something we can carry forward in the regulations. So I think, yeah, I think we're looking for input, right. particularly on that point, and mm -hmm. factoring all those considerations. Right, and I don't have, as I said, I think there's fairness issues, there's, um, you know, intent um, issues, so I, I don't know that I have a suggestion for the answer, but I, I'm not comfortable with just necessarily saying they all have two story. They're all able to have two stories because I don't <laughs> think that is consistent with what we're doing. I'll just make one other point, and then I will. Um, as I said, I, I'm not sure. Particularly if we if we went one story, then um, you know the setbacks particularly the internal setbacks, could potentially be loosened up. I had one question on page uh, two of two uh, on that draft, attachment A. It's at the very end and talks about accessory structures. It says accessory structures, this is in B, uh, will not be permitted in any other setback area. And, um, and that's referring any other than the rear yard setback, I believe. But shouldn't that, to be consistent, say, accessory structures greater than six feet will not be permitted in any other setback area? Don't we have, doesn't the other district allow setback um, stru uh, accessory structures less than six feet or less within a, a closer setback? So I think technically structures that are less than six feet are not even considered accessory structure. I think um, barbecue grills are considered accessory structures. They're less than six feet. Well, there, there's regulations for how to place um, built-in barbecues, mm -hmm. and it's under the accessory structure code, but in the definition section of the zoning code, an accessory structure um, that is subject to those limitations is six feet or greater. Okay, so it could say that just to be clear. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could okay. Um, so that's my dilemma. I haven't actually solved anything. Maybe I opened more cans of worms than we already had open, but uh, so there you go. <laughs> Can you organize? Someone else? Yeah, I don't really have any other questions or comments at this point. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm I'm glad to see that we are coming forward with these site standards. Um, and one of the concerns that I heard before was um, a lot of the ones that we're hearing now about privacy. So I think in terms of and um, making sure that we avoid a lot of non-conforming expansions. I think that the proposal ad addresses some of the non-conforming expansions. Um, it's just remarkable to me that there has been no real modernization of many of these homes beyond internal upgrades in the 58 years. It's like hard to imagine any other part of our town that hasn't undergone dramatic changes. And I think that this neighborhood, I mean, it could benefit from from allowing people to do that. So some of my particular comments, um, with respect to, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the one that seems to be the most controversial with the second story. 
I'm of the opinion that this neighborhood should be able to sort of self-determine what they want it to look like. So if the if the folks in the Marshall Street Stevens place were able to or motivated to put a single story overlay um, on their neighborhood, then they should. But I think it, that requires like a two thirds highly motivated um, super majority to get that done. And just based on the numbers, 46 homes and only 21 responded, I don't see how they ever get to that, in which case um, I don't. I don't see their, this great motivation to keep it single story, so I wouldn't limit it um, to that. And if the neighborhood to the north were to have been so motivated to stay single story, then that would be more compelling to me than you know to force the people right abutting them to to stay shorter. But if it seems um, that if the neighbors to the north aren't willing to put that limitation on themselves. They shouldn't be able to put it on their their neighbors who don't want to do that. There's one two story to the north. We're, we're not sorry. This is for our discussion now. I and I, I I note that, but there's one now, but there's nothing actually keeping anybody in that area from going to two stories. And and you know, it, so that isn't compelling to me because there there's nothing restricting any of those people from doing it. And if they did want to restrict it, they could put their own, that neighborhood could put a single story overlay on itself. And then I would be, find it more compelling to then compel their neighbors to also abide by something like that. Um, in terms of sort of the privacy issues that will come up, I think design review is where those issues get addressed in terms of how those second stories are designed and what they're facing. And, um, whether they can even see onto their neighbors. There's a lot of ways to prevent that in the location of windows and how op opaque they are and how high they are. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways to re reduce the perceived privacy impacts. Um, in terms of... Uh, some of the other issues relating to non-conformance. I think what Sally's point is about getting a little bit more information about the setbacks would, would be really useful in helping us understand what is, where the non-conformance currently is. Um, I all agreed with her that concerns about density are sort of allayed by the fact that the code is drafted so they have to keep it as um, a two unit dwelling. And I also am not, I don't find the topographic issue compelling. I live in that Montclair area that you're talking about where a second story is the same height as the neighbor's first story. So um, I think that's uh, not quite a pressing issue um, for most people. But I, I do think that getting to the bottom of sort of what that happens with those flag lots on that north. Um, is something that that we have to kind of consider further and get a better understanding of the rationale behind the, the flag lots and how those, it's really the 6, 11 that are facing the north that are sort of most impactful. Those are my thoughts. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I have a few things. Um, I think that, I think it's been said previously, but I think that this, even though it's an R3 and it kind of feels like an R1, it's kind of more similar to an R2. So, um, but I think that, you know, if you had a spectrum with R1 on one side and a typical R2 on the other side, I think this would probably be more so of an R1 just because of the, the neighborhood and the context. Um, so I think that the two issues, I think, are the height and the density. Um, the height, I, I'm okay with the 27 feet and the two stories. I, I don't feel like, logically, I don't feel like a lower designation, zoning designation should, you know, 
have a say in what it technically is a higher zoning designation as far as how high they can go. I think that 27 makes sense to me because it's the same as R110. And um, I would say that the only way that I would be comfortable with, with saying that it should be limited to a single story is if the neighborhood got together and said, we want to make this one story. Um, so I would say that that would be what I would suggest if if people are against the, the second story. Um, as far as the density, um, you know, 35%, hypothetically, you know, if you did one story, um, at 35%, you know, you're adding roughly maybe 1,000 square feet. Um, and then if it was up to 40% or 45%, obviously that would be more. But with the setbacks, I'm not sure how much you would you would get. So I, I, th I think that at the end of the day, I think the height is something that needs to be kind of decided on by these 48 um, properties. And I feel like the density maybe should be lowered. Um, but again, I don't know if, if lowering it is going to cause um, some type of reaction in, in another way. So I think that it would be helpful maybe to do um, a study of some sort to look at what is going to be the situation at 35% density with these current setbacks that are being proposed um, and kind of play with that number in terms of, yeah. Uh, sorry, do you mean the floor area ratio? Um, density, right? Yes, sorry, the okay. floor area ratio and, and the coverage. Okay. Because as far as 40%, I, it's just hard for me to say that 40% is the way to go when I don't know how that affects these pro properties individually. And I don't know if that's going to be, given the lot size, I don't know what that would do um, with the setbacks and, and with the height. Um, so yeah, I, I'm of the opinion that I think that the height should needs to be probably all, um, meaning that everyone's allowed to do two stories, um, 27 feet, or or it just becomes a single story overlay. And I think the density probably should be looked at more closely before a, a number is decided upon. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything else to say. I think that's about it. Go. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I have a, I don't know, my, my thoughts are more around um, kind of a high level view um, uh, of this neighborhood and, and the general character of the neighborhood. Um, I think um, it's difficult for, for me to certainly determine um, what's the right course of action. I, I still don't get a sense from the community, uh, from the folks that have spoken and, and maybe the folks that I haven't um, uh, come to to voice their opinions yet, how they feel about um, their own neighborhoods, their own neighborhood. Um, I think um, if we if we have to um, determine or put in place a process, then I think you know using the um, the R1 um, as a kind of guide makes a lot of sense. Um, it's it may not be perfect, but it's it's um, it's a set of um, uh, a, a zoning codes that um, that this town has adopted, and in principle it works. Um, but for me, I think the larger question is: I, I think you know what what is the character of this neighborhood? Is it, is it do we you know is it is it this kind of charming place um, that the 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 residents want to maintain as such? Um, I, I really don't have a clear picture on this um, at all. And it's difficult for me to really understand uh, the architecture um, of this neighborhood and the kind of the character of the buildings yet. You know, I, I need to sort of spend a little bit more time, I think, in the neighborhood taking a look at some of the, some of the character uh, of, of these dwellings. And, um, you know, this, these are sort of abstract kind of numbers and figures and things, but you know, what will it actually do to the neighborhood, right? What will a two-story dwelling, if it sort of, majority of it goes that way, um, how will that change the character of that neighborhood? It's a question mark. Um, I mean, it looks like there's um, already four um, two-story, uh, four, yeah, double-height uh, 
dwellings already in that sort of neighborhood. And I'm, I'm, it's more of a question. Were they built at the same time as the rest of the, the development? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So there's a kind of an intentional, um, I guess it's because of the topography, I, I would imagine. Um, but I think I, I, I do agree with uh, uh, the majority of the commissioners here. I think that um, regardless of what's imposed um, as a regulation, I think the neighborhood um, has the ability to kind of self-regulate and create. Uh, if it is, if they do want to preserve the character, the inherent character of this neighborhood, I think they have an opportunity to do that. Um, uh, and I think if, if there is not that kind of agreement, then uh, there are certain um, processes that will take place, such as the design review uh, process, um, which then goes into a more case-by-case. -case. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think certainly there needs to be a process put in place, right, for the residents. Um, and. Uh, I, I think where where the uh, the staff is going with this adaptation or um, yeah of of the R1 seems to be a good start a good place to start um, and I think for me I, I don't fully have the information um, yet to determine whether or not a you know a single story should be imposed as opposed to a a two story um, yet so that's kind of where I'm at. Okay. Um, oh. I could just I could add a couple of comments just um, in addition to what you said as far as feedback. When I, when I look at the development as a whole, you know, there are, there are the 11 units that are backing to Homestead. So that, I think, would be a consideration for a two-story um, option there. So I would hate to see us say no two-story units when that might actually be an ideal um, place there as well as the units I don't know the um, grade differentiation but in the upper left hand corner the the homes that back to the existing two-story homes um, might also be ideal locations so I think you know we should explore it further and consider whether it should be a case-by-case -case basis and, and let the community decide Okay, um, from my perspective, um, you know, my initial reaction was also like I didn't have enough information and we didn't have a survey and all of these things, but um, as I thought about it more, um, first of all, it's a very cumbersome project to have to go through and survey all of that. And what we're really trying to do is set standards. Um, and you're really not having to deal with those standards unless you're doing some major addition to your home and really changing um, your home, you know, rebuilding it basically. And so I'm actually okay, from my perspective, um, setting what we think are reasonable floor area ratios and setbacks without necessarily needing to go out and surveying every single home. Um, because I think as staff explained, and I think they're right, it's, um, you're not going to be able to create something where everything is going to be conforming. And so we just have to, from my opinion, uh, come up with something that seems um, where the majority of the things are conforming. Um, and that seem kind of reasonable. Um, and so I think just that's, that's my opinion on, on that. Um, in terms of two stories, um, I, my, change, my thoughts have changed since this first came up. Um, uh, I think when it first came up, I was um, aligned more with the rest of um, with the rest of you in terms of um, not restricting it, but I've seen how many people have come out here to, to talk about the impacts on, on their privacy, and I think it's more than just the 11 that are on the north side because there's another four on the, what is it, on the west side. Um, 
But in any event, there hasn't been one person that has come out from this community to say, we want two stories. Um, and so, I'm, you know, but yet we've had a lot of members, a lot of members of the community that have come out and said, we don't want um, two stories um, impacting our privacy. Um, and I'd be more compelled to argue um, that we should allow two stories if there were, uh, it just doesn't seem like there's much of a dialogue or discussion and no one has come out to really fight that point. Um, and I think what we're looking at here, if you really, if you go drive that neighborhood, it does feel like you're getting a lot of density, but you're not seeing it because it's all one story. Um, and um, in these flag lock configurations. And so I don't know that we necessarily need to mess with that. Um, and that um, we can maintain the character, we can give people the certainty that they need uh, to do what they want to do. Um, and everyone kind of knows what the, what the rules are and we're not really going to prevent anyone from remodeling their home and just because you you know want to remodel your bathroom all of a sudden you're gonna have to move your wall 10 feet back that's it's not that's not what's going to happen here um and so that's that's my take on it um i guess what i would ask is for the four homes that are already two stories and i can imagine why they are two stories because they abut the the creek there right or the um is there a way to carve out those four and allow those four to remain two stories? Well, under the non-conforming regulations, they are grandfathered in. It's just a paper. But if they wanted to rebuild, rebuild, then they would have to rebuild. So. Correct. And so can is there, it has to be for the entire, um, the entire district, or can you? You can do carve outs if you want to try to. I mean, it has to, it can't be spot zoning, so to speak, but if you want to create zones. If you want to create zones or try to do a mixed approach with um, two stories in certain areas, that's, that's always feasible. Got it. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think from my perspective, it's just um, there's a lot of density. Um, I don't think that you're adding more density by increasing. Um, going to two stories. So I just want to be clear that um, from my perspective, that's not adding more density. You're going to have the same number of occupants. They're just going to have more room. Um, but I do think it is severely impacting the privacy, not only for um, the neighbors to the north and to the east, but internally within the compound per se. Um, because a lot of these, I mean, the, um, the setbacks are, are really minimal. Um, especially because some of these people have built to the, essentially to the property line. Um, and so um, that's where, I guess that's where I'm falling on, on these issues. And um, we need to give staff some, I guess you're looking for direction. <laughs> right. Um, well, you don't necessarily need to make a motion. I mean, obviously, all this feedback. If so, I, I think the the point of the study session is to hear from each of individually. If you want to continue to maybe coalesce around ideas or anything, that's up to you. But no, no formal motion or anything is needed at this point. Yeah, yeah. I just want. I mean, do you want any kind of polling on two stories versus not two stories, or any specifics around? Or you? I. I guess there's different varying. I think the. The, the biggest work effort would be there's some response with regards to more information or if there is enough information or I don't need more information. So that's where if you, you know, if you do want more information with regards to structures and existing structures and setbacks, and that, that potentially is a very large effort. If you want the specificity with that, um, it's, it's kind of a... You either go the scientific way, hiring surveyors, which we're not, the city is not going to be paying for, but, or you, you know, we use some of the existing information that the applicant has given us 
and try to um, do some um, more um, estimated measurements off of that and maybe put in where the recommended setbacks at say 20 feet kind of how that sh how that relates to those structures per se um, I think that's that's something that would that I think staff needs some feedback on and then we can <clears throat> I think I heard some feedback about looking at the floor area ratio what the numbers are essentially between say the 35 percent which is applied to the r1 district and and 40 percent we can come up with you know given your average lot size or the smallest lot size and the largest lot size where those where those numbers are and how large the units are right now yeah i think um i i think that in terms of the 35 percent versus the 40 percent i think that if I don't know what the process is for the property owners to come together and decide if they want to do a single story overlay, but I think that whatever that process is, we should probably figure that out. And then in terms of the density, I think that if a second story is allowed, I mean, this is just my opinion, but if a second story is allowed, then 35% would probably be better for coverage and FAR. And if it becomes a single story, then maybe 40% just to give them a little bit more because then they're losing yeah. doubly. Yeah. But, but I would say that the first thing is for the neighbors uh, to come together and decide if they want to make it single story, because that's, that's going to affect everything, in my opinion. Because if they all agree on one story, then that's going to change most of the stuff that's in here. So I don't know what that process, though, is like. I mean, we can, we can bring back to... Um, you know, there is the code section, the single story um, overlay district, which it specifies a process in there, and presumably we would apply that to this this section as or this district as well. I don't know if that section is um, specifies R one only, but we could take a look at if that applies to just R one or if it can apply to this district. Yeah, I think really it would just be a matter of we could add in this that it is subject to those provisions. But yeah, we could investigate that further for sure. If you do do, if that is <clears throat> something we go forward with, I'd want to know if there's any other precedent in our town for us imposing a single story overlay on a neighborhood without them self directing that process. Oh, like a city initiative yeah. versus yeah. a neighborhood initiative? Yeah. Because okay. it's mostly. It seems onerous. If, if they're the only neighborhood that has uh, had to have, have that done, as opposed to mm -hmm. do it, doing it themselves. Right, but if we, if we yeah. were consistent to what we do, then we wouldn't allow any of the rear lots mm -hmm. to have two-story. Um, so I, I think that the, the rationale for trying to do that, and actually keep in mind that they, we, we brought this up with city council, but right now the rules are they only have, it's two-thirds of the, Households that they hear from, not two thirds of the actual existing household. So, if three people vote and two people vote for um, right? single story, yes, it is. And we brought no, we brought them an issue. Yeah. This is an issue, and they didn't want to. They didn't because there's not a lot of the single story process that goes into play. But, but aside from that, if we're trying to be consistent, then we have to think about. And the more I thought about what Zach said about 15,000 being the net area, that actually makes this even more egregious because then you have 15,000 square footage for that back lot, not counting the driveway. And here you're talking, you know, 4,500 square foot right. for the back but lot, including the if, driveway. If that flag lot is surrounded by to the north and south with two stories, and, and then the ones on the sides where there are two stories. Right. It's got well, it's that, that it is it is its own there's zoning. It's issue. it's it's it, there is an equity issue. I, I definitely grant that in terms of the front versus the back properties, um, but that's how we've defined it in the R1 district. And and relative to the R1 uh, to the north, I mean, this is the R3-4.5, so it can have. Um, and some of us attended, actually, Kim and I both were at, and all of City Council was at the Missing Middle presentation, and talks about just this kind of development where you get a little bit more density, but you're keeping it low scale and 
um, you know, in, in congruity with the, the rest of the neighborhood. So I think it is a different beast, but I agree. I don't think, I mean, I think we need to do more thinking yeah. about two versus one, what's fair, um, and what works. And let me remind you that when you say flag lots, it's not just the ones along the northern boundary. It's also along Homestead. It, yes. It's kind of a perceived flag lot because these are just odd lots to begin with because right. they don't right. have, they have like an, e some of them, mm -hmm. but not all of them, I think, have an easement to the roadway. It's right. very strange. Well, yeah, no, I totally agree. The whole thing is messy. Um, and although there's no privacy concerns for those bounding Homestead for the people on the road, there are people privacy concerns for the people in the house. Mm -hmm. So whether you really want to build a two-story where then homestead is right out your bedroom window, I don't know. That, that's you know. So, but regardless, it's it's messy. I think uh, we're not aligned on how to handle the two-story versus one-story, um, and I think we're probably all open to more input. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So, and then as far as the the work involved in coming back with more information with setbacks and the existing structures, is there a consensus of what you want? I guess. I don't want to do a whole lot of work. Anyone else, is anyone else, is anyone saying that they need a survey? No. No, no okay. one, no one so needs a survey. We'll need look a survey. At I just want to know, I mean, I can draw a visual line, you know, uh, on the backyards, on the front yards. Are those close to 20 feet or not? We I can mean, do are a, we talking 15? Yeah, we can do a very you know, precise. Just some ballpark. Yeah, we can do a precise measurement off of what's been submitted uh, and show you the 20 feet. That would and be helpful. And you can kind of see all. where they have placed the building footprints, how that relates to that. It's, that again, not going to be That's exact, sufficient. but yes. hopefully there's some room for fuzziness of <laughs> yes. knowing, anticipating that. Also, sorry, um, is there a precedent for having it be one story, but having it, let's say, be like 22 feet, but one story, like single story? Hmm. So you could give them the higher. flexibility to go higher, but higher. still keep it one story? Single story? I mean, generally, in the, the, the one story, it's the height limit, for, and, and it's not an absolute, is one story and 20 feet. Um, our code does allow one story is taller than 20 feet, um, but that's subject to review and approval by the Design Review Commission. We periodically do get one stories that are 22, 23, 24 feet, and they go to the Design Review Commission. So in theory, the absolute height is 27. You could, in, you could, in theory, if you wanted to do a 27-foot one story, it would just be subject to review by our Design Review Commission. Okay. Just one. <clears throat> the other thing we wanted to add is it sounds like the commission would like or appreciate receiving more input from people that actually live or yes. are own properties in this neighborhood. So we're Absolutely. going to go back and take a look at maybe holding a public workshop in that neighborhood or near that neighborhood so that we can get that feedback and encourage more of those property owners and yep. more of those people that live there to come to your yep. next hearing when you take this up again so that you have the benefit of that that uh, be very those comments. Yeah. Okay, so we'll close study session and move on to public hearing. Item number three, 831 Arroyo Road. Okay, thank you. Let me gather my stuff because they got to they got to continue with the meeting. Okay. So, yeah. and if you guys could kindly exit and hold your conversations outside so we can move on to the next items, that'd be great. Uh, good evening, Commissioner Semek and Commissioners. Uh, the project before you is for a parcel map subdivision application to subdivide 
uh, the uh, property at 831 Arroyo Road into two parcels, including an interior lot and corner lot, par and corner lot. Uh, parcel uh, one uh, is an interior lot, which would be 10,029 square feet in size, and parcel two, a corner lot, would be 13,404 square feet in size. Staff would like to note uh, the applicant provided an updated tentative map that was an email to the commission today. The revisions address condition number 11, which was a right-of-way dedication from the Public Works Department, which required a dedication of a 25-foot radius at the intersection of Arroyo Road and Mountain View Avenue to the public right-of-way. Um, in addition, the revised plan uh, identifies, correctly identifies the exterior side of building setback line along Arroyo Road, which was listed as a setback line instead of specifically an exterior side setback line. A hard copy was also provided at the dais for each commissioner. Uh, uh, parcel 1, the interior lot is indicated, uh, exceeds the minimum required width of 80 feet. Uh, that the, This is indicated as lot number 1, which is the upper lot. Um, it meets the minimum width of 80 feet, depth of 100, and meets the minimum lot size of 10,000 square feet for the R110 zoning district. Uh, the lower parcel uh, is... Uh, Parcel 2 is a corner lot and exceeds the minimum required width of 90 feet, depth of 100 feet, and meets the minimum lot size of 11,000 square feet for the R110 district. The subdivision conforms with the applicable goals, policies, and programs in the Los Altos General Plan, complies with the applicable requirements in the city zoning uh, ordinance. Staff does believe that the subdivision is consistent with the housing element policy 1.5, uh, that the development will result in an orderly and compatible development pattern within the subdivision and in relation to its surroundings. Uh, the subject property is located on the corner of Arroyo Road and Mountain View Avenue and was originally created as part of Montebello Acre Subdivision, which was recorded in May 1927. As shown on the screen above, uh, the existing house was constructed in 51. As indicated in the subdivision map, the lots were originally developed as consistent size lots of 40,000 square feet with 200 foot widths and 200 foot depths um, with similar size lots uh, west of Mountain View but of varying shapes and forms. However, as indicated in the city's GIS map, uh, the, the parcels were subsequently further subdivided into lots of varying sizes with 8,000 to 17,000 square foot lots along the west side of Mountain View Avenue across from the site with varying shapes, size, and sizes. Lots east of Mountain View also have varying shapes with significant portions of the subdivision having consistent shapes of 16,000 to 17,500 square feet. However, for parcels directly along the west side of Mountain View, uh, Mountain View Avenue, the uh, lots have varying shapes and sizes and do not maintain the consistent rectangular forms of the vast majority of lots to the far left of the site. As indicated on the screen above, the red outline indicates the location of the proposed two-lot subdivision. Staff also notes the uh, three subdivisions that occurred in a similar manner as the proposed lot that are highlighted in green. Um, the pattern of development is, is further reflected in an aerial photograph that, uh, which outlines the subdivision, the location of the proposed subdivision, and it provides the outlines of the previous subdivisions. Uh, the upper subdivision is a subdivision that occurred in 1980. It resulted in a subdivision of a larger lot into two lots, one that was 9,166 square feet and a second lot that was 8,154 square feet. The middle green lot was subdivided in 1982. It resulted in a lot size similar to the proposed lot, two lots. Uh, one lot was 13,253 square feet. The second lot was 10,101 square feet. The lower green lot uh, was subdivided in 1962. It resulted in a lot that was 10,454 square feet and a, another lot that was 19,819. Uh, the proposed lot that the applicant is, is proposing tonight is for one lot that is 10,029 and a second lot that is 13,116. Uh, due to the consistent pattern of subdivisions of corner lots in, the sub, in this uh, subdivision, 
um, and the varying shapes and sizes of lots in the overall subdivision, staff does believe that the parcel is consistent in maintaining a similar pattern of subdivision for corner lots. Its overall form and size is compatible with the pattern of development within the subdivision. Staff must note that we received approximately 19 emails and letters, which were all emailed you, to you today, so you probably received many of them today. Um, all of them are provided at the dais for you also. Um, and this concludes staff's presentation, unless there are any questions. Thank you. Questions for staff? I have a couple. Did you yeah, I just had a quick one. What's the average lot size? I'm sure you mentioned this, but sorry. Uh, what's the average lot sizes to the, to the west? The, the, the more normative uh, rectangular ones? The lot sizes are 16,000 to okay. 17,500. Okay. Thank you. So I saw that the lot con the lot size conforms, but there wasn't any mention of whether the setbacks conform. And I just wanted to make sure that was the case. Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, project site, the uh, upper lot is an interior lot. It does meet the minimum requirement of setbacks of 80, of 25 feet in the front, 25 feet in the rear, and 10 feet on either side. On a corner lot, there is a requirement for a 25-foot front yard setback, a 25-foot rear setback, a 20-foot exterior side setback, which is along Arroyo, and a 10-foot side setback. As reflected in the middle subdivision, um, and as indicated in the aerial photograph, you can see that the location of the side yard and rear yard are very similar to the, to the proposed parcel. And, and, and the configuration is the same. So it does, all, all of them conform? Correct. Yeah. Um, and my second question was on the, on the Arborist report, do we ever, do we get peer reviews on these or we just accept them? Do we have any? Um, we um, did not have peer reviews. The only trees that are proposed for removal are, are trees that are dead. Um, though the applicant proposed the removal of a significant number of trees in the initial submittal, uh, staff recommended that all the trees be maintained except for the trees that are dead. Um, any trees that are to be removed will be addressed at a future date through a design review application, and that is the pertinent process for removal of trees. And at that point, the DRC will have an arborist report submitted that will evaluate the location of any home in relation to any trees and the condition of those trees. Yeah, my own, I just found it um, odd that there weren't that many pictures of the trees, um, and particularly the ones that they're calling dead. Um, I mean, there's just six pictures or so, and there's a lot more trees than that. Um, and, and so I just found that odd. Um, and the other thing I would say is that there, was, there wasn't any discussion about trees that were listed as poor and whether there was a path for fixing, you know, uh, improving that condition. Um, And so that's why they just didn't under, you know, uh, is this uh, an arborist that we've, that we're, that has, we've worked, that we've gotten reports from before? You know? um, yeah, this particular arborist, um, Kilty, um, they've submitted arborist reports to the city on numerous occasions. So we're familiar with the work. I mean, at times we may push back and ask for more details. Um, in this case, given kind of the scope, it was more of an inventory and, um, um, I don't know that we disputed any of the claims of the, the trees that were dead, but we can definitely provide more information if that's desired. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, the three uh, previous subdivisions, what were the years of those three again? I didn't catch it. The uh, upper subdivision was subdivided 19, actually. The um, upper subdivision was subdivided in 1980. Um, the second one was subdivided, the middle one was subdivided in April 1982, and the bottom one, the bottom green one, was subdivided in May 1962. 
Oh, and I have the tentative map. 1962, you said that last one? Yes, yeah. the, the lower one was subdivided in May 1962. And uh, are the um, um, those lots, the subdivided lots, do they, are the, the front yards considered to be uh, fronting onto Mountain View Avenue? So on the middle lot, um, the front yard is located on Mountain View. Um, the side yard is on Raimundo um, in a similar configuration as the proposed lot. The um, upper lot, parcel A and B, um, it's, the setbacks aren't indicated on it. I don't have that on the tentative parcel map. Hmm. We can... Based on the configurations, yeah. um, given that the narrower frontage is on Mountain View, it, it appears likely that um, all of those lots have frontages on, um, on Mountain View, with the exception of maybe the one on the upper part of Vista Grande, which is, has a longer length, um, shorter, a longer frontage on Mountain View. Right. When, when, I have a question. Yeah. When we did our housing our element, when we did our housing element, I remember there's a few pages that list lots that are larger that could be subdivided. Is this one? Is this one um, identified on that? It, I'm talking about the list. The list where we identify lots that could be subdivided as as meeting our housing requirements. And then just one clarification: when, when we say front yard, we're referring to per zoning. On a corner lot, a house can front on either frontage. The front yard just indicates which one would be the 25-foot setback versus the exterior side, which would be 20 feet. Okay. There's no Hi. further. Yep. Hi. Go ahead. Okay. Duho, did you have questions? No, no. no. Oh, you meant no. <laughs> okay. Um, you didn't explicitly state the zoning. Is this R110 or is it more? Is it bigger, R1? Um, yes, I did indicate it's R1. It's an R110 zone property. Yes. Oh, you did indicate that. Sorry about it. that. I wasn't clear enough. I didn't find it. Okay. Um, and you might want to uh, just make a, a statement. I, I see that this is this neighborhood probably had some CCNRs, and you might want to make a comment as to the fact that the city doesn't enforce those, or what the status is with the city's perspective on CCNRs. So, I will again go to this real quick. So, uh, the applicant in the middle application did not indicate that there were CCNRs, but if, if there are CCNRs for a property, uh, the city's perspective is not to enforce CCNRs. Any CCRs are to be enforced by the owners themselves, civilly, not through the city. We would require the properties to comply with the development standards per the district. Okay, and um, I had one more question, but I'm not seeing it, so I guess I don't have another question. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Does the applicant have a presentation? When you be, when we get to public, you'll, you'll be when able we to, get to public if you fill out a form, you'll be able to speak. Hi. I'm uh, Rick Hartman from Home Tech Architecture. I'm the architect and not the civil engineer, so but as far as houses and orientation, um, we read the letters from the neighbors as well, and there's a lot of misunderstanding in there. It's not a rezone. It's not a 10-foot side street setback, you know, those kinds of things. Um, we have already started designing the two homes that would go here. Um, the one that's at the corner of Arroyo is going to have a front door facing Arroyo, so that should be consistent. And the Mountain View, of course, will face Mountain View. Um, all the setbacks are met. The, the home next to there's only one real adjacent home to this project, and that's the one on Arroyo. Um, today, that's a side yard of 10 feet, although the existing house is about 12 feet. Now it's going to go to 25 feet. So 
with the new setbacks, the new home will be much further away from the existing home that's immediately adjacent to it. Um, uh, other than that, it's, yeah, whatever the setbacks are for the R110, it is zoned R110. I think the neighbors would really like it zoned a higher zone uh, for, you know, uh, 14, 15,000 foot lots, but it's a 10,000 foot lot zone. So we're very careful to only do what we're allowed to do and not break any rules at all. So other than that, everything else should be handled in design review for the homes. It's certainly the trees. We, we were very disappointed that the arborists felt the trees were horribly, horrible condition all the way around the property, but we want to save all the big ones anyway. So the ones on the corner, the ones back by the creek, they're, they're going to save all those. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for the applicant? <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you. And so with that, we will open it up for public comment. Um, and we will do, I'll call the first three speakers, Michael Luck, Emily Y, Wu, Wu and Terry Demis. Great. Thank you very much. Three minutes. Um, the first point we want to make, the map needs to move further south. It's, it's capturing Gilbert, but it's not capturing all of Arroyo. So that's the first thing. That is part of the Los Santos cut out. The blue line is uh, actually too far north by half a street. Secondly is... Um, can we go back to... Sorry, just yeah. one second. Can we go back to... Well, uh, can, can, can we stop the yeah. clock so I... Can... <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm losing the... Go ahead. <laughs> the, yeah. the blue that you had the... The houses all on? Sorry. They had the map, the Google map, right? That one. You see Gilbert or oh, Gilmore? Like That's a Mountain View street. Mm. And Arroyo, the other half of Arroyo is down below. Mm -hmm. Right? That's really important because it's the, the Montebello Acres is made up of three main streets Arroyo, Vista Grande, Raimundo. It shifted. We, we live. We live at 840 Arroyo Road, directly facing the property 831. Um, I'm here today with my wife to express our opposition of the proposed plan, as we understand it. Uh, we moved to Montebello Acres 22 years ago, and we moved there because it was a rather unique community. It offered very open front yards, very welcoming kind of feel, um, very large lots. And so... Uh, what our concern is, as we look at the plan, is that it uh, would, we believe, detrimentally change kind of the character of the, the neighborhood. You know, if the house is facing Mountain View Avenue, it would be the only street of 36 houses on Arroyo Road that doesn't face Arroyo Road. Now, the architect just informed us that it's going to face Arroyo Road. But then my question is, so then what's the setback? Is the setback 25 feet or is it 20 feet? Because they're using the 20-foot side setback corner lot argument. But if they're really facing Arroyo Road, then it really should be 25 feet, just like every, other 30, every of the other 35 houses on Arroyo Road. If you then take that to the next two streets, which is Raimundo and Vista Grande, they also also face their main streets or respective streets. So that's really important. If you look at the nine corner lots within Montebello Estates or Montebello Acres, they face Arroyo, Vista Grande, or Raimundo. So our concern is if you plant or rotate the house facing Mountain View Avenue, the concern we have is that somebody would put up a fence all along and that wonderful walk that you walk down the street would be faced with 90 feet of fence because if you orient the house towards Mountain View, how do you have a yard? Or how do you have any privacy? And that's our concern. So we request that the committee reconsider the plan or at least work with the owner to figure out a way to match the character of the neighborhood, which is open, welcoming, broad, large, open front yards, and orient the house facing Arroyo Road. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emily Wu. Um, hi, good evening. My name is Emily Wu, and I live on Raimundo. I've been there for 30 years, and I strongly oppose the approval of this development. 
It's going to set a very negative impact on the character of our neighborhood. Um, these two proposed homes will face Mountain View Avenue, not Vista Grande, as in the case of all the other homes in Montebello Acres, Raimundo, Vista Grande, and Arroyo. Um, there's a lot of, there are many corner homes on these three streets, and every one of them faces the street, not Mountain View Avenue. As far as, I don't think this map, the first match was correct, but um, there's a large home being built on Raimundo and Mountain View Avenue, and that faces Raimundo, as it's supposed to be. And there are many houses on the corners, and they all face the street that they should be facing. So I think that you need to seriously consider not approving this plan, and I ask you to take a high-level perspective of this proposal, since it will jeopardize the character and community of our neighborhood and set a negative precedent. Also, very few neighbors in Montebello Acres received a notice of this hearing, so I think there are many more of us who would protest this development if we knew about it. So, thank you. Carrie Demos, then Nancy Ellickson, and Susan Flesh. I'm uh, Femi Dimas and uh, live in Arroyo. And my predecessors here really covered a lot of the points I was going to make. I don't understand the rationale whatsoever because all of these lots that you see there, over here, there are 17,500 uh, square feet. And what we have there is a slightly bigger, you might want to call it, 23,000 feet, and we're going to break it. And the one that is going to be on the side there, because of the cor on the corner, will be 13,000. The other one will be 10,000. And it will establish a precedent, because if we move that way, then all those lots that are uh, 17, 20,000 square feet, whatever, half acre, then they can be split up in the future along with this precedent that we will set. And there is more density, more cars and so forth as we, if we were to move that way, and that will really change the character. And that's of the neighborhood, and that's why we're really opposing this split. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Ellickson, <coughs> Susan. Hi, I'm Nancy Ellickson, and my husband and I live at 820 Raymundo. By the way, a corner lot and a big corner lot. Um, we've lived there since 1992. Raymundo is, as you can tell, the middle street of Montebello Acres. Um, Montebello Acres is 80 homes, and Sean, I'm sorry you're wrong. I painstakingly did an average last night. Um, the average lot size is 18.3. So it's, it's not 14. Um, it's not 13. It's much higher than that when you average in the small lots and the big lots. Um, our neighborhood is comprised of long, long, re long term residents as well as newer owners. And we actually have several second generation neighbors who own the homes they grew up in. Um, as I said, the average lot size is 18,000 square feet. This is really, there was a reason for this. The CCNRs that were developed in, I want to say the late 40s, I'm losing my voice here a little bit, so forgive me. Um, they were really, they thought a lot about these CCNRs. They wanted the homes to be separated and spaced, and that has made Montebello Acres, a really sought-after area to live in because of these large lots, because of the spacing, and because of the setbacks. It's very, very unique. Um, as you heard earlier, all the corner homes, um, my home on the corner of Raimundo and Mountain View Avenue, I face Raimundo. Uh, I'm sorry, my home on the corner of Raimundo and Mountain View Avenue, I face Raimundo as do the other corner homes. Um, 831, 
breaks this consistency with the two lots, including one corner one, not facing Arroyo. This isn't compatible with the character of our neighborhood. Plus these two homes, which will no doubt be 3,000, 4,000 square feet on small footprints. We all have 3,000, 4,000 square feet, but we're on a lot larger footprint. Um, the housing element in the city's general plan, ooh, and I better speed up, I'm gonna run out of time here. The housing element in the city's general plan states that the city will ensure development permitted in the creation of land division results in an orderly and compatible development pattern within the subdivision. This doesn't do it. Um, we disagree with city staff's approval and we ask that the commission deny the subdivision based on the positioning of the two uh, proposed homes. And by the way, 20% of our folks in our neighborhood, we're a tight neighborhood as you can see, a lot of people turned out, 20% received a flyer. No one else knew. And so you would have seen a lot more letters if um, this had been communicated. Thanks so much. Thank you. Susan Flesher. And that's the last speaker card I have, so if anyone else wants to speak, please fill out a green form. Hello there. My name is Susan Flesher, and I am married with three children in the Montebello Acres. We've lived there for 35 years. Um, I also represent um, a neighbor who did write in who's lived there for three years. So we represent the old and the new. Um, one of the things that has not been mentioned yet is that we do, when we bought the house, we did have CCRs. I understand they're not enforceable, but it did set the tone and the design for the neighborhood at the time that those were set. Therefore, most of those homes have 40-foot setbacks from the front yard. We have, I think, 25, or, sorry, 15 feet from the back or from the side, and 25 from the back. So we have much larger footprints of open space around our homes than what is being proposed. I understand that it does meet city rules, but it again sets a different tone for the neighborhood than what we currently have. Um, I also wanted to say that. Um, Basically, if we take the space that we're looking at now, we divide that almost in half. We're talking about virtually half of our current lot with probably a house about the same size of my house. So I'm looking at kind of taking one lot property in my neighborhood and putting two houses on it. It's a significant impact on that neighborhood and a different feeling and sets the tone entirely different for what we've created. Earlier you said, is this a special, in the earlier argument you had, you said, is this a special community? Is this something unique and different? Montebello Acres is unique and different. We really do care about it. And again, old and new, people who've joined us in the last decade or longer. And so we are here to protect it. And we do want to work with the city on this to make it really a special place. And we are all also very supportive of creating an ADU instead. If there's, the ones that have been creative have that feeling. The ones that are up there that were done many, many decades ago, the one at 60, 1960, it feels more like a home in the neighborhood with an ADU. We are also supporting that for this proposal. If this house would be one large house with an ADU, it would have, I think, consistent support of the neighborhood. The last thing is I did want to say I did not receive an email. I live very close, or a, a notification of this. Um, in fact, very few residents on Vista Grande did. So when 20% of a community receive it, it's really disappointing. So um, the word's getting out. People are writing in. People are making a vocal point. Um, what else? I think that's probably the most of it. But I, I defer to your opinion, but I really hope that you'll consider the neighborhood's feelings. Thank you. Looks like we've got one more. Sorry, though. Taking some of my husband's time since he didn't get it all. Um, I'm, not, I'm not prepared because I wasn't planning to talk, but I think that there are a few things that were not covered. And one of the things is, is that, as you may know, the proposal was for two Montevideo-facing homes. Okay, and all of a sudden, today we hear that, oh no, supposedly this is being redrawn, and that it has changed. And that we have never heard of. You can even look at the map that is on, on in front of the house and everything else like that. I think that's probably some reaction to probably seeing what we've done. Who knows? But, you know, that kind of puts into question as what exactly is going to be on this house? Um, we don't know because 
you know, last minute, here we are, and now supposedly it's facing forward, you know, which is what I think many of us also want. But what do we know? I mean, we don't know what to expect because we haven't seen it. Um, one of the other things to consider about the setback on that corner is where it is located and that quick, sharp turn there. Um, as my husband mentioned, we are literally right there at 840. We have had so many cars almost come into our house because people don't stop. And there are a lot of people that walk there. Our children walk there. I have two high school kids now. And we've grown up there. We've been there for 22 years. And we've asked for stop signs. Never happened. Um, and so if depending on what gets built there, I think you have to be really careful because that is a very dangerous corner. Um, and anyone that walks there, and if you come to Montebello, you, you know that. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Another thing to also say is that we live right across the street, and we didn't get notification. So I don't know who else did it, and we talked to the person who lives next to us. She didn't get notification. And supposedly, if you read this, it said that everyone within 500 feet got notification. So each of our lot's fronts are 100 feet. So that means five feet this way, five houses this way, five houses this way, five houses that way, right? And it says 80 people, homes, got sent this message. I don't know what message was sent out because we have 80 homes here and we didn't even get a notice. So, um, you know, I think you would have gotten more people here not happy about this because it came as a surprise. Um, and if you look at all of these things, it's because we just found out about it. I mean, if you got 20 emails, and I think, I don't know if three of them you got because ours isn't on there, um, our neighbors next door, the Krugs are not on there, and I don't think the other neighbor is on there, um, Great House is in there too. 20 letters about this, and that's because we just figured out about it two days ago. So I think you really have to take a look at that and you have to consider this, and this should not be passed immediately because we don't know what's going on, and you haven't heard from everyone that you probably will. Thank you. Okay. I'm close public comment and open it up for discussion. Well, I'd just like to clarify then with, uh, I guess, with staff. So the proposal is that the lot that faces Arroyo, that property would now face Arroyo? Is that what I understand from the architect? No. Well, we don't have a... So originally there was a proposal as part of the subdivision, but a proposal shouldn't be part of a subdivision, and they, we asked for them to remove any reference to any proposed structures, since that would be part of a design review process. What's being proposed today is location of setbacks. Uh, that is not a reflection of the location of the frontage of the house. On a corner lot, a frontage can be either facing the fr along the front zoning setback line or it could be facing along an exterior setback line. And in addition, according to our design guidelines, if there is a proposed single family home along a corner, there is a requirement that they have to maintain a consistent setback line as other homes along the frontage. So even if it is 20 through design review process, if the established setbacks along that frontage is 25, then they, need to, they would need to maintain a similar setback if that's the frontage. Okay. So do we know, do we know what, do we understand what the, what the setback of the adjacent um, property is or the home? No, no. So. Okay, so um, I feel like we didn't in our packet have quite all the information that would have been helpful because if you look at the both the vicinity map and the specific, uh, let's look at the 500 notifi foot notification map. Um, in both of those maps, the two um, lots are grayed out as being Mountain View. That you have the top green ones that, which are what 1062 and 1066. Those were indicated as being Mountain View. Right. Um, so I don't know what which is correct there. So we had no information. So I didn't even look at those. I mean, I'm very familiar with this neighborhood. I used to live just over the border in Mountain View and walked through here all the time. Um, so anyway, so I, I didn't look at those two specifically because 
our maps indicate a mountain view. But what you're showing us here says that those are Los Altos. Those are subdivided. What, what I'm reflecting or showing is that they're part of the subdivision. Uh, as indicated in the, in the parcel, as, in, as indicated in the drawing above, the black line is reflection of the property lines of the city or the, or the city uh, outline. And so those two upper green parcels are part of Mountain View, but they're part of the overall subdivision. Okay, part of the those, are, those are Mountain View. Okay, yeah. so, so then we have um, the, the one in the middle that was on Vista Grande, and then there's another one uh, on Raimundo. Um, and you had talked about some numbers, but I didn't, I didn't really catch all of them, what the lot sizes were. Um, so I'm going to basically stick with my assessment that I looked at um, before um, hearing the numbers for those subdivided lots, the, the two that are um, Los Altos subdivided lots. Um, so I felt that this didn't, um, I felt that this didn't achieve the um, consistency um, criteria um, for the findings that um, that we have to make in order to subdivide the lot. We've seen, you know, a number of subdivisions, um, and in my tenure, this is one subdivision application that actually is sort of not a unique property, but one of a part of a, a quilt of the neighborhood. Most of the other um, subdivision applications are sort of one-offs, they're older, very large properties, or they're along a busy road. They're not really um, in uh, the fabric of a very defined neighborhood. So um, to me then, splitting it into, at least with the information I had in the packet, into basically a 10,000 square foot lot and a 13,000 um, square foot, 13.4, uh, was just not consistent with the nature. Now, now um, you did talk about some numbers for those two other subdivided lots that are Los Altos properties, um, but I, I still don't think it necessarily changes the fact that it's really not. It creates that 10,000 square foot lot in particular is going to pro presumably, it, again, correct me because I didn't write down the numbers you quoted, but that will be the smallest lot no. in that neighborhood. No, the, the first one in 1980 is 99.66 square feet and 81.54. But is that the ones that are in Mountain View? Or? And the 1982 one divided 10,101. So They're that was, almost equivalent. Yeah. Yep. And then I would wonder that the lot that's directly across Mountain View Avenue, the corner lot there, it looks small. I, I, those are the, the ones that I had sort of hatched to myself, but we didn't have... Uh, the numbers. Um, it sounds like maybe there's some room uh, to make it more compatible if if the uh, frontage of lot two actually faces Arroyo, um, but it has similar setbacks um, to the houses, which may be up to 30 feet. I think someone mentioned that, but I think that is true. When uh, so that would potentially um, impair the ability to to um, create a house of any size on that lot. Um, but basically, my initial imp impression on looking that was that it did not fit the compatibility standard, and so I was not um, willing to approve the application. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'm sort of struggling with this one. This is the, the opposite of like the last um, example where everyone is really united in their opposition. But when I look at the findings, I, I don't see any finding that relates to consistent with the neighborhood. I mean, it says the, each of the findings I can't dispute. I mean, it is um, in conformance with the general plan and specifically housing element and infrastructure. It's uh, it is in conformance with our land use designations and the density. Uh, it doesn't cause substantial environmental damage or injure fish or wildlife and or cause public health problems and or conflict with access easements. So it's not about it saying, you know, does it match 
And I, I so the quarter of a question I have for the city attorney is in an environment uh, where there is so much pressure on cities to allow uh, the density permitted by, by code, if we come up with a finding that says we just don't think it fits, is that, would that hold up? Is well, that a basis for I, denying this? I mean, I think that you have to adhere to the findings in the Subdivision Map Act, which are set forth in here. So I do think you have the ability to uh, interpret the facts that you have before you and make the findings as, as specified in the staff report under the Subdivision Map Act. But you need to look at the application and make a determination based on that information. I will point out on page three, it does say uh, the land use element, um, the housing element, uh, the first bullet point there on the top of page three, the city shall ensure that the development permitted in the creation of land divisions results in an orderly and compatible development pattern within this subdivision. So that is specifically there. Um, are you in the Are you in the report or the actual resolution? No, I'm in the report the page report, three. Page three. But the term is compatible mm -hmm. development pattern. Mm -hmm. right. It doesn't say that it has to be exactly following. It doesn't say that it has to be an average. It has to be compatible. And I think as the record indicates tonight, with some other lots that are in the 10,000 square foot range, that almost demonstrates that there are compatible developments of this size in this neighborhood. I think especially if you're looking along Mountain View Avenue. The corners, right. Right. And so there is a pattern, even if you're looking at the widths of the lot that are on the <clears throat> east side, once this corner lot is subdivided, the width of that lot is comparable to the widths that you see on the right side of the map. So it is within the context of Mountain View Avenue. I think it's important, though, to make sure that it also remains within the context of Arroyo Road. And so that front piece, I would feel, needs to be facing Arroyo Road. Um, but we're not taking up that issue, right? This is just subdivision. That would be in design review. That would be, that's the problem. This would be in design review. Right. But the only information in the staff report was this residential properties in the area are diverse in their shapes and range from 16,000 to 23. 40, 433 square feet in size. So again, I feel like if I, if I'd had this information in front of me when I was doing the research, I might have reached that conclusion. But but that's not what was in the staff report. So I'm a little uncomfortable personally. But anyway, you have other people to hear from. Yeah. So I mean, when I when I look at the other six uh, individual homes all on Mountain View. This does feel actually more compatible um, on Mountain View Avenue. But I do think that if this is facing, and it should face Arroyo Road, then the view from Arroyo Road is actually going to be consistent because how do you know how deep your neighbor's property goes? And then at the same time, the folks who are on Mountain View also want to be facing uh, a home and not be just look. If, if they didn't and they just built a home, then a really long stretch of Mountain View is facing just the side of, of, that, of that home, whereas here you'd have something also facing Mountain View. So I, I don't, I, when, as I read the findings, I don't see how this doesn't fall within something that is allowed. And then... The environment where we are so desperate for housing, it's hard for me to justify not allowing another home if it can, if this can, if it can accommodate it. Thanks. Oh. Um, yeah, so I'll be honest, when I first saw the project, um, I didn't think that there was uh, an issue. I thought that since it was following everything, um, and it was following the, the lot size and, and the home size and everything, 
Um, I thought this was probably kind of an easy decision, but um, reading the emails uh, and hearing from, from the neighbors, I think that it is a little bit more complicated. Um, but I, l like my fellow commissioners have said, it's, it's hard for me to um, justify a reason to not um, approve this just because, you know, everything is in compliance and as far as compatibility it's it's kind of a you could say it's kind of a subjective thing um being compatible and are not being compatible so um i do wonder what a house with a adu would look like um where the adu was facing mountain view and um the home was facing arroyo but um, again, I know that's that's not a, a two-home project. That's that's still just one home with an accessory dwelling unit. So, um, yeah, I, I'm struggling as well. Uh, I don't I, I don't really know um, how to justify this though in terms of uh, not approving it. So, <clears throat> that's that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think given the information uh, that we have, um, I, I find that it's, it's it is absolutely compatible. Um, I think when I when I look at just from a sort of an urban urban layout um, perspective, planning perspective, uh, clearly those three streets are very strong streets that organize organizes uh, this neighborhood. However, the Mountain View corridor is is something different. There, there are a number of exceptions, number of different lot sizes, geometry, um, and you know that, that's that's the nature of that street uh, and the surrounding uh, environment, uh, the creek, what have you, that that causes those variations to occur. And I think the the, the precedents that have been set are very consistent with um, what is being proposed here. I, I really. Um, I'm struggling to find. I, I understand the, the the sentiment from the from the neighborhood, no no doubt. Um, I think we um, I think we struggle with change, but um, you know it's it's a neighborhood. I think things change inevitably. Um, I, I, but I don't I don't see anything that's um, that's being proposed here that feels out of character. Um, I think it, it, clearly it's going to be up to the architect, and hopefully we have. Um, a good architect on board who can handle some of these um, challenging design issues. But however, those are design issues, and with um, with some um, expertise, those could be negotiated. Um, but from a kind of uh, um, sort of property layout perspective, I, I, I can't see anything that's not consistent with what's happening there in that Mountain View um, corridor. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to support this, this proposal. It's my turn. Um, yeah, I'm actually surprised that this was um, um, as. Uh, to me, this is really easy. Um, uh, to me, I, I mean, this absolutely conforms with. Um, what um, uh, what our zoning is, um, and there's not one variance that's being asked for. I mean, there is um, um, there's no. I just don't even. I couldn't comprehend how we could deny it um, because again, it it completely conforms um, all of the um, and meets all of the conditions. Um, and it would be completely felt. It would feel completely arbitrary to um, to deny it from from my perspective. Um, and um, and so I I um, strongly support um, moving forward with the subdivision. So if anyone wants to make a motion, would you like to? I just want to ask a question. So. Um, uh, a lot of the comfort level here at the dais was about this um, facing Mountain View Avenue. So does that mean subdivisions do or don't apply 
elsewhere in the neighborhood. Sorry. What's your question? I'm not sure. So my question is, so are you saying, because the, the justification is about Mountain View Avenue, are you saying that if future projects come to us from this neighborhood and request subdivision, is that about, is it about the fact that it's on Mountain View Avenue or is it about the fact that any of these properties could in theory be well, if they're subdivided, all though they're not all big enough necessarily correct. to be. There's probably um, one more 870 corner. Well, like, yeah, maybe. All right, so you, yeah. you don't think that's I, a factor? No, I mean, if they're 14,000, 18,000, you mm -hmm. can't get to 10,000 yeah. minimum. Minimum, you need 20,000 foot lot mm -hmm. to be able to divide. So, um, mm -hmm. that sorry, that brings up a good point. Did, does anyone know realistically how many could be subdivided from the? Sorry, I can't count. However many are on the map. Uh, no, I don't have that those numbers. But for an interior lot, for two interior lots, you would need a frontage of 160 feet wide, and a total of 20,000 square feet. If you try to do a flag lot, you would need 25,000 square feet and a minimum 100 feet in width. And none of the lots to the left of the site have that minimum allowance. They either don't have sufficient width or not enough lot coverage. Um, potentially on this upper right side, and I, if I could log in, I could probably get each of the square footages for you, which is what I did previously. Yeah. But I'm not sure it's really That's our, relevant yeah, to I, if, conversation. If, if it's not, uh, if it's a... Um, moot point. Um, I will make one more point, and just to be clear on um, what we're particularly, I mean, we're not short on um, expensive, you know, the addition of expensive homes in Los Altos, because um, any tear down um, and rebuild, even when there was an existing home, counts as a new home. So we know that. Um, an ADU is affordable by design, and so that would actually be more likely to um, help in terms of our BMR type um, housing, but just just wanted to state that. Okay. So I'll put forward a motion to approve the tentative map to subdivide the property into two lots per the findings and conditions set forth in our report. Uh, I'll second the motion. All those in favor? I'd still like one point of clarification if I could. So there's no way in this we're either making a motion to approve or deny this request. We cannot make any condition on the fronting of the lot that faces Arroyo. Yeah, they, um, there's definitely opportunities, and I actually can give an example. Um, an earlier subdivision, this was probably seven, eight years ago along Edith, um, there you can you can I think it's more challenging to build in setbacks that are different from the zoning, but for, say, initial development. And so um, there was a three-lot subdivision on Edish, and there was some concern about height. And so um, in this case, the applicant was amenable to, and so the city had stipulated a condition that the initial construction would be one story in height. Then subsequent, it would be subject to the zoning. Um, so you could look at, say, an, an initial construction with a house that has a front that faces on Arroyo, um, if you so chose. I think. Through the design review process, looking at the setbacks, um, we, would, we would likely look for a setback that's more than 20 feet to be more consistent with the neighborhood um, through the design review process, which supports that type of requirement. But mm -hmm. um, if you were concerned about a, a house facing on Arroyo, that could be one solution um, if you're so inclined. Um, yeah, I would, I'd be comfortable with that. Yeah, I would also think that it's important for um, the one facing Arroyo to make sure that it faces Arroyo. I would say that that's important. Hi, um, I'm that developer. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, may I? I don't think you can. No, I'm it's sorry. Closed. It's closed. The opportunity to speak. Um, well, there's a motion and a second on the floor. I think right. you'd have I to would amend the amendment motion. To the motion, if you're proposing sure. it, so that it's sure. I'll order. make an amendment then that the condition of approval be that the property adjacent to Arroyo face. That street. So the, do the maker and the that. seconder accept, accept the that. amendment? Yep. Yeah, I'll second that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous.
I didn't say oh, I. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> say I, sorry. but I was I I still heard. mulling the <laughs> amendment, which I think alleviated um, uh, a significant part of the issue. Um, I, all right, with that condition, I will say I. Okay. So it's unanimous, and we'll close that. Um, people think like they need a break, or should we move straight into the story? Right. So we'll take a three minute break. All right, John. Yeah, I think we're going to start on. So we'll resume with our discussion of story poll policy regulations. Yeah, in front of you is a revised story poll policy that incorporates the recommendations that you had from or provided at your last planning commission meeting when you took up this item. Um, specifically, what the revised policy does is eliminate the requirement that the story polls be up for 30 days, at least 30 days, for after the, uh, the, the first public hearing, and says that just that immediately after the public hearing that photographs of the story polls and netting in their context and neighborhood will be taken and then those photographs will be posted on a board to be posted at the site uh, as soon as possible after the first public hearing. Um, 
to address your earlier concerns you had about story polls. And then we also provided a draft of a letter or report that would go on to the city council um, with your recommendations uh, for your modifications to the story poll policy. So with that, I'll hand it off to the commissioners to continue your, your discussion on these. Anyone like to start? You make me pick. <laughs> I had a couple points of clarification. So, um, so what I saw that you had written here was 20 days before the initial um, public hearing. That would be before the planning commission, appearing before the planning commission the first time. Uh, that's correct. But then is the 30 days. Where's the 30 days? Yeah, because yeah. there's, there's 20 we, before. Wasn't it 30 afterwards, we, we, which makes it 50, we or is it 30 altogether? took out the 30-day reference completely. The idea was to have the story polls up for as limited a time as possible. So the 20 days before the first public hearing was the initial period that the story polls were up. That, I believe, you felt was sufficient to notify the community that there was a project in review pictures of that those story polls would be taken and then right after that first public hearing those story polls could come down and they would be documented by the photographs that were taken and then reposted at the site so just a small um, tweak and I think I mentioned last time is I think we take out the immediately after the first public hearing your microphone they, they will be photographed because we don't really care when they're photographed right yeah. if the, they look best on the first day they're installed then this um, requires that they can't be photographed until after the first hearing. So that time limitation True. is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I guess the only, well, for discussion, whether we want to say it's still up for 10 days after the public hearing, so at least it doesn't go, it doesn't go immediately, and then say that after those 10 days, then it's immediately taken down. Um, Right. But it feels like there should be some period of time after the public hearing for people that came here and got listened to that discussion and then wanted to go see it in that context. Sure. So that brings right. you back to 30 days total. It, yeah. yeah. At least Fair 30 enough. days after. Yeah, because I felt it was missing, that closure. Because the way it's written in number three right now, with everything that's struck out, they take photographs, but the mm -hmm. story polls don't need to come down. Let me ask you, what is the time period uh, by which they have to, um, like, appeal whatever decision is made? If, for example, it's 15 days. Is it 15 or 10? Well, it, they, but it could be continued. there's not really a lot of opportunity to appeals because you're making recommendations to the city council, so there's no appeal taking place there. It just goes on to the city council for consideration. Unless we deny then there's an appeal. Well, even if you deny it, you we take to council recommendation that you're denying ah. the request, not that you're actually denying the project. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It and then might would it be possible if um, the first public hearing is like before the is there instances where it would be before like a different commission than us, like the Bike and Transportation yeah. Commission? And that's, I remember Complete things streets. used to come, they'd be sort of multiple different public hearings they'd come before. The, those are public meetings, but they're not public hearings. And, you know, this, okay. these are going to be your recommendations. So right. feel free to adjust the language here as you feel I mean, I would want it, it, if we're doing it, to be at the hearing that has the most that it gives the first impression and the most attendance right so if you're I, saying a meet there's a difference between a meeting and a hearing then hearing seems like the right word and, and I think the link was trying to be between a public meeting which is just noticed as part of the agenda versus the public hearing for the planning commission which has the mail noticing the publication mm -hmm. in the newspaper um, and the posting at the property site. So those were trying to link together. So it was one larger package of public notification that was being done. Does that align with when they're required to put the polls up? I mean, they don't need to put, they need to put a, the polls up for that hearing. 
as opposed to those other meetings? This actually requires that the polls go up even before all that notification gets done. Because we're, what, about 10 to 15 days before we yeah, the mailing? Currently for the um, for um, a development review project, if you're going through the kind of the review trajectory, right now it'll it goes through review, gets deemed complete, has a public meeting that's non noticed other than the public agenda posting before the complete streets commission, then the first then the public notification for the planning commission meeting, it's required to go out at least ten days before, so we generally mail it, I think it's fourteen days prior to ensure that it every every recipient has it at least ten days before the meeting. I wanted to have a brief discussion about the materials used to and mm -hmm. in looking at the uh, photographs in the packet where there were flags used instead of the plastic netting. Um, that's not specifically um, delineated under materials and methods. It currently just says netting, but I find the flags to be similarly appropriate and um, offering less wind resistance, so I would be open to flexible um, use of those two materials, including flags. You mean offer the option? Yes. Or both. Okay. Yeah, I think there was a lot of discussion at the council when there was two, uh, the night that they had two um, proposals for uh, waiving part of the requirements, and um, uh, some of the council members were more receptive to the hybrid approach, whether flags would be used in some areas, mm -hmm. but not necessarily, but where the netting could be used, they wanted that yeah. used. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the rationale why, um, what's wrong with the flags anyway. I mean, forget that the whole story poll thing we think could be done technologically mm -hmm. differently and better, um, but I don't see why flags aren't acceptable. Yeah. When you look at this example and the photographs, you can get the same idea whether it's the netting or the right. flags mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are completely visible. Right. And to me, the, the netting is actually more confusing because are you supposed to be, I, I mean, I know you're supposed to be looking at the top, but if you're the public, you could be wondering, do you look at the top or the bottom or what is that? Mm -hmm. right. What is that width Which supposed end? to be? Uh, you yeah. know. This is netting. It doesn't even photograph very well either. No. I'm going to interrupt our discussion because I didn't realize that we had oh. a public speaker. Oh. I apologize. So, um, and I didn't realize. It. So, if there's anyone that wants to speak on this item, uh, now's the time to fill out a card. And, uh, Marcia? Yeah. Hi, my name is Amir Chai, and uh, actually, I came here tonight just to talk a little bit about uh, my experience with the story point installation at uh, 4856 and 4046 El Camino. Provided a report and all the pictures, photos, everything you have, it's from my experience. I was trying to be as comprehensive as possible to give you an idea of what we've been through. Um, I think that uh, definitely the planning staff. Uh, <clears throat> Suggestion it's in the right direction to, you know, considering the safety risk that you've been seeing in one of those pictures. He was uh, actually a near miss. You know, the pole ended up inside the building, and uh, somebody could have been there. We had tenants in the building. So I think um, just my personal opinion in, in this, uh, maybe this whole process, this entire policy needs to look into more details. I mean, we are in um, 2019. We have self-driving cars around here. And we are still back in the Stone Age kind of thing. Um, um, there are cities around us. They have better ways to do it. And uh, actually, Palo Alto doesn't have a story poll policy, and they're very conservative, as you know. And, um, you know, having a five-, six-story building, putting those poles just... Uh, you know, it must be a better way. I mean, we have a lot of architects here that maybe come up with ideas, you know, 3D modeling, some other ways of actually doing this um, so we can avoid situations like we did. It could happen in 30 days. It could happen in 60 days. We don't know. This is a situation that happened, and it was very, we were very fortunate that it happened in the weekend uh, this time. But the next time, we don't know. And I think it's the responsibility of the city um, 
Planning Commission to look at this very careful and consider very heavily the entire policy, uh, the netting, which uh, I experience a lot of maintenance. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't understand why we cannot find better ways of actually addressing this. Um, I have to say that, uh, you know, in the past, I think there were some city council members that actually thought that this is a great idea to, to have it, but I think we have a lot of smart people around. I mean, we don't have to put a 65-foot pole to demonstrate where the building is going to be. It can be done in a different way. Uh, you know, smarter and safer for everybody. Um, and um, I think uh, um, like to, you know, uh, provide any information that you might need to make those decisions and available to provide any other additional um, information for my project uh, that you might need and ask any questions to make this one better. Thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, what kind of engineering goes into the installation? Well, first of all, I mean, all of those pipes are uh, steel pipes, uh, and it depends on the height of the height of the poles, right? I mean, uh, in, in my case, we had poles that actually, you know, like the staircase poles, they, they went over 65 feet. Um, and they are steel. They are steel pipes. You can't use PVC or anything like that. That's number one. If you have probably a two-story building, probably you can use PVC material as something is that is. there an engineer that designed the system and Correct. rated it to so some sort of So actually, I, uh, the person that I hired, it's actually a, um, a licensed general contractor that is doing just story pole installation. He has his own design firm. That's what he's doing all day long. Actually, he was here actually in one of the meetings when I was coming for an exception to try to explain to city council the risks that we've been facing. And that's what we went for the exception, and they still denied it twice. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's the answer. And uh, um, um, then, then it's the, the third part where. Sorry, just to, so, but it's, so you went design build, yep. right? And is there, and that, is there an engineering study, though, that comes with that, in the, any of that process that gets submitted to the city that gets approved? Or they just kind of look at it as saying? Well, I mean, what we do, we just take the plans, the site plan, and then we follow the city policy of where we need to put the story poles for the, every point that is high in the building. Right. And then we create a site plan, and the civil engineer is creating a site plan, and then we deliver that to the um, uh, story pole consultant. Story pole consultant looks at that, and then he designs it exactly on the spot that we need it, at the height that we need it in that spot, and so on. So he designs the whole system, figured it out where all those uh, guide wires go, and can we put guide wires, or maybe we need a standalone? Like in my case, I ended up putting two wood telephone poles because I couldn't have guide wires in that one, and that was the design of the system. We had to work around mm -hmm. and figure out something to accommodate this, having six tenants and 40 parking spaces, so. Great, thank you. And, and this issue that uh, you photo documented here happened during installation, or is this? Uh, no, th so that no. issue happened, um, I, I believe the date in the email was December 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, we installed this one sometime mid-August-ish. Um, yeah, so sometime mid-August we installed it, and then we maintained it. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some of them in the first 30 days start bending, mm -hmm. And we had to kind of put them back up and just kind of work with the consultant. This incident happened, I think, around December 1st. It actually was within days after the approval of the project by city council, within a couple of days after. Okay, and, and that's one of the steel members just falling? Is that uh, right? Yes. So Cross member or what? Uh, so literally the, the, the pole was, mm -hmm. uh, this pole was uh, mounted on top of the roof to, you know, it was literally to show one of the um, uh, side of the building height. And then uh, somehow it just punctured the roof and it okay. just ended up inside the building, as you see in the picture. And um, um, 
I mean, it, it, this is just downright one. This is downright crazy, right? It's, it's dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, there's responsible. It's completely because it's 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 it's, it's, it's 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 akin to scaffolding, right? You know, in in scaffolding, that's a that's a that's a serious sort of engineering. Uh, there's engineering protocols, and people, you know, cities sign off on scaffolding, and there's you know huge liability issues, and it's it's it has to be engineered properly, yeah. and has to do a job, right? And I think it, it seems like it, it would be crazy for us not to, um, you know, set some height limits. You know, I mean, I, I think there is value in story polls. Don't get me wrong. I think, for example, the, the story polls on um, Main Street, uh, at, at the corner of Main Street in San Antonio for that project, I think that, at least in my opinion, it, it helped me to kind of understand the scale that was being proposed. And that's like a two to three story structure. Uh, and I think that's that's reasonable. But I think BBC you, can be used yeah, for that one, right? But I think when you enter into, I mean, the pictures that I'm seeing here, when you enter, you know, 60, 70 stories, uh, 70 feet, it's uh, it's terrifying. I, I think I think we need to kind of impose some type of yeah. limit, right? Yeah. If we, if we feel well, that story pole is, is still, <laughs> well, uh, well, so still I valuable. Think, but that brings us back to potentially what what John you maybe are looking for. So last time there were only four of us, and uh, Phoebe's not here this time, but we were the only person um, who was actually on planning commission when the story polls, uh, when they planning recommended against story polls and it then went to council and they accepted it was Ronit. So I don't, um, so none of us really other than Ronit mm -hmm. tonight um, can speak to why it ended up the way it did. Um, we all recommended against it. Well, I know we that unanimous. in the absolute that the Planning Commission was against the story polls. But, I mean, why did it end up with this netting instead of flags? I mean, what earthly, even if you ignore the whole thing about technology, why is it insisted, why is it important that it be this two-foot uh, netting um, to... You know, where did that come from? Was that a recommendation that was put? You know, I don't know that any of us know. So I don't recall. I mean, yeah, I think that right. the intent, it, it, the desire to keep this is to dissuade mm. yes. the height in my okay. mind. Okay, so so there's there's two pieces. I think John, correct me if I'm wrong. That you've given us here to look at. One is the story polls policy with some yellow stuff that, um, you know, we've been working on. And then a couple of pages after that, you have a draft, which is, we're supposed to be also talking about tonight. Is that supposed to be a letter that's going along with the proposed revisions to that, council? Right. That's going to be your, the basis for your report that goes to the city council. Okay. All right. So we have you two... Know, Things. Okay, go ahead. I thought when I was looking at the comparisons of other <laughs> cities that do story polls, I mean, I wonder if any of them have them on buildings higher than three stories. I mean, mm, when I look at right. Portola Valley, Carmel, Half Moon Bay, might go uh, Los Altos Hills. I mean, I don't. They, they don't have an El Camino for like we do, mm -hmm. where. Well, maybe they do, actually. Let's see. Saratoga, Woodside. I mean, are they requiring it for single-family homes? Some Only. of that sounded like it was residential, yeah. Right. Yeah. So can we find out even more, drill even deeper, there's anyone else who ex has experienced putting these on a five-story building? Well, I would ask about Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Palo Alto, others along the El Camino no. Corridor. Yep. Well, those Red don't have the requirements, it says. According, I'm looking at that chart that was an attachment. I don't know how old that is, though, because yeah. that attachment looked like it was 2006. So, um, But a chart like that that were right. relatively up to date would be very useful. To show, let's create a height limit. Right. So, so here's, Absolutely. I mean, so he, here's my thinking. John wants to get something to council immediately and no 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 no, no, no you is, don't this is your oh this is our to, uh, our baby right. your, okay our, scribes here for you but uh, this right. is your <laughs> okay your effort so then so okay so it's all on us um so we could either um 
spent a lot of time doing the research and devising something, which we should probably do. The question is, in the meantime, do we want to take the obvious low-hanging fruit and send that forward within this letter explaining we recommend that we undertake the following the to address the these uh -huh. um, issues that are, are serious and, you know, affect the town or something like that. Is that, I think that's where where these two pieces came from, right, John? Uh, yeah, the, the two pieces came from, our discussion. prior to the last meeting, I had a request from one planning commission member to put into words what you saw the last time, and that started your discussion. And as you mentioned, there were, there were only four of you at the last meeting, so you didn't have the full breadth of your collective wisdom on this. Um, so there was some tweaks to that language, and then you asked to that we come back with a, a draft report. Right. You know, one thing that you might consider doing is appointing a subcommittee of the Planning Commission to delve into this in a little more detail and have that, whatever the work of the subcommittee is, brought back to the full commission to work on. Well, um, just some things that I just want to say. I think last time um, I kind of was very clear that I think this whole thing is ridiculous. And uh, I don't see the merit of doing story polls at all. Um, I think that it's the more development projects that we're getting um, in the next year or two years, especially in our downtown, I think it's going to be really, really dangerous to have you know four or five stories, um, just these polls. I think the netting, uh, I would strongly suggest that we at least change the netting um, to flags, because I think just inherently having netting going around the poles, especially with a storm, you're just, you know, you're asking for something to fall. Um, so I would say I think that needs to be changed. And then, but more broadly, you know, the way I see it is um, there's two assumptions. There's assumptions from one side that thinks that you need story poles, and then there's the assumption that you don't need them. And no one has really tested it out yet. I would suggest that Broadly, and I'm not saying we can figure this out right now, but broadly we should have a testing period of some sort where a project comes in and we give the developer the option to do 3D modeling, 3D construction, whatever we want to call it, or the story polls. And then we can have a meeting and we can see how many people are in favor, how many people don't get the height from the renderings, and then we can really make a conscious decision if we need the story pool policy. Because right now, it's, it's just two people assuming that you don't need the other, and we don't know. We don't know how many people really want it. So I just think that's really, um, we're never going to get anywhere. Because we're just going to keep. I'm not sure how that would work practically. Because yeah. yeah. then someone's going to come in, and yeah, we're going to say, gonna like, that didn't both. work. And they're going to have to lose you know all this time to then go back and put the story pools up. So yeah. feels like we just need to. Um, because I look, I completely agree with you, and I think um, um, in this day and age, and especially in the heart of Silicon Valley, um, where renderings have come and um, and being able to do the three D modeling and 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 three D printing and all of these other things, um, that there's far better ways of um, of doing this, um, as we've seen in the past. Um, City Council hasn't necessarily been open to it, and I think um, what we can do is put something forward and have them react to it. Um, but I think we need to kind of take a position, and um, I don't think that we can leave it up to the developer and, and then kind of test it because they're going to come back, and and uh, it's unfair to the developer to, you know, for them to go down that road and then go to the 3D way and, and then us say like, oh no, sorry, just kidding. It, you know, we can't really mm -hmm. tell and so now go put story polls up. And yeah, yeah I think that... Lo losing time on the development process. Yeah, yeah, and I, I didn't... I probably, I probably phrased it wrong, but I didn't mean um, literally saying this or this and then having them come back. I just meant that maybe we say that, you know, for the next however many um, months that projects that come in, we just say you can do a 3D model rendering and we can see if, if the public, we can see if people are against it or if they can understand based on what they're giving us and we can determine it that way. And my opinion is I don't think, pe I think people will get it. I think people will get it from renderings. I think they'll understand how tall a four-story building is because 
there's a four story building right next to it. You know, they're going to, people are smart. So I don't think that, um, I think if we don't enact something, we're just going to be arguing about the story policy for years so and years and years. I think we're all in alignment. Phoebe, yeah. who, I mean, the three yeah. that weren't here last time, and then including Phoebe, everyone is in this, uh, the same position. But the policymakers are in a different opinion. And when they had the opportunity to give exceptions, they didn't even do that. So I think, mm. in my view, the best strategy is not to go down the rabbit hole of creating a subcommittee to argue all the different reasons why we think we're right and they're wrong, because there's it's no point. But identify ways that we can help improve the policy. Right. One of them is timing. One of them is netting. They seem less controversial, and hopefully we. Right. And one of so them is I mean, and, and from this yeah. discussion, though, it also seems netting. like one of them is height limit. Yeah. Right. And there is. That's when we. Let's put forward the first two, just so at least there's some relief I agree. during the winter mm -hmm. right, as we are dealing with it. And then we can work on the height limit. But also, sorry, height limit in terms of the neighboring parcel. Because if, if someone's proposing a four-story and there's already a four-story next to it, or a three-story and there's a three-story next to it, to me that doesn't make sense to have them do it when you can tell from the height from the neighboring parcel. So, I mean, stuff like that. There, there should be, I don't know. There should be. I just think the whole thing is is really silly. But right. Um, so again, I there's, think there's I low. Like, so there's. I'm going to go back to the yeah. low hanging fruit analogy. So um, we can say um, with this um, amend the page that has the yellow on it. We could say here's what we recommend at mm -hmm. minimum be done to at least go a little way to fixing right. the yeah. issue. And that could be, I think we agree on this this whole thing that should be, what, 30 days total or whatever it is mm -hmm. the number is. 20 um, 20, it's 20 plus 10, 10 or uh, whatever, which needs to be included. Plus, I think I hear that we all agree that the flags should be sufficient, that it doesn't need to be netting. And then there was a third suggestion, though uh, I don't know that yeah. we have any data to... We need more data on that. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we, yeah, for the rest. So those are low-hanging fruit. We could put that forward, and then in this letter we can say... Um, you know, we need we can do better, and this is what we recommend. Um, I, I just don't see any down. harm in putting forward the height limit the height because limit. they can always reject that part of it but we um, don't have or any, not. I don't know that we have data to make a sound recommendation. Is three four story, four story okay, but, but five isn't? Is no, three story three okay is and four? Three is okay, but is four not okay? I mean, yeah, I think it's, that starts to get into the. I. I would want more information before yeah. making mm -hmm. that. I'd want it, sure. for example, I think it's worthwhile to get the data from these cities. And if possible, John, in addition to these cities, the two people who have come in for exceptions had engineers that presumably submitted yes. something. What is it that they, is it worthwhile having a conversation with those people to say, what's the tallest you've done? How did that go for you? What's you know. I mean, so so to be clear, they don't submit any drawings for you guys to look at and sort of say, hey. They, they do submit a drawing that shows the location of the story poles. Okay, but not, not, the, not the engineering, not the detailing, but not the connections or anything like no, that. No, no engineering, no construction details on those drawings. And the liability is ultimately on the on the owner or the Correct. applicant. You have that. Have them sign some that <laughs> they assume liability. Okay. okay. And so we're we're all we're we actually all have the same objectives as council. What what's this? You're laughing. Okay. I'm just um, laughing. We have the same objectives, liability. which is to you know open openness, transparency, um, providing a representation of what the project's going to look like in the environment, um, and to a lesser extent. Um, to notify the public. I, this is mentioned a lot. Notification to me is secondary. We have other, we I, wouldn't put sto story poles up to notify neighbors. I mean, it that, serves as notification. In, in my experience, that is the number one good thing that story poles do. Right, but that's not notify the, the objective. Else is sure. just the objective for the the you know planning for, for council is to actually represent what's coming. And yes, by the way, that also provides some notification right. um, because you're right, you can't miss it. But um, anyway, so I, I think, again, the low-hanging fruit 
or at least those two parts, which is mm -hmm. <laughs> duration. And then, yeah, yeah, duration and flags. In terms of just the draft, John, my only suggestion would mm -hmm. be to move up the section about where we our rec our re I think our recommendation, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. is that we should eliminate the story polls altogether. Or, right? or well, is it we support them at? Well, it's good. that's a, that's a really good question. I don't yeah. know if we're all aligned on that. I mean, um, do we all feel like that story polls uh, have no has no value here? Is that is that the conclusion they were reaching? Well, if there's I'm, I'm oh, well, I know I know where you stand on. <laughs> I think they have some value to some yeah. people, but I, I don't think it's accomplishing what the <laughs> purpose is for the vast majority. But there are some people who. Yeah. They serve a purpose. Sure. Yeah. If if <laughs> if one of those purposes is to make it more difficult for the project to go through, that's also so, so serving a purpose. But I think there are for some some people they see it, like they cannot see it without physically seeing a pole. Correct. Yeah. And, and you know, I mean, it's. But this... we're not. Our goal shouldn't be to be able to make it. I mean, well, first of all, I think it has to be safe. If we think that we can <laughs> yeah, accomplish, it has to be safe. First and foremost, think, it's about safety to me. Yes. And, and then, then, then it's about, you know, giving, giving everyone the same sort of opportunity because some people may not be able to read drawings like the way that professionals read drawings, renderings, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, when it's flat on a page, eight and a half by eleven, which I think is a problem. I think it should be, no, no, no smaller than eleven by seventeen. As, as an image or a series of images, um, it's, it's hard for, for people to connect to that. And how certain are we that the, that the, um, the, the architect or whoever, the, the applicant, is, is, is giving us the, the, an accurate model? I mean, I actually, I agree with the fine effort. I mean, there are things called uh, artistic license, right? You know, I think. We will. I mean, they, they are. It is supposed to be certified. Somebody certifies that it's representative. Yeah, but there could be. But even then, I mean, be, yeah. I mean, to me, the safety. You climb up the pole and measure the pole and make sure that. Absolutely, it's, you know. This, yeah, this no, I'm not climbing up anything. That. Yeah, without having to. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the safety is just critical, I and and then don't disagree with anything. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. All right. So everyone's. We have consensus that. Yeah. This is what we want to put forward. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so close going, enough. Going back to the highlighted section, I just mm -hmm. um, following on your guidance here. I I think at the end of that first sentence where it reads, "A story poll shall be installed at least twenty days before the first public hearing on the project," maybe conclude by reading, "and may be removed after that first public hearing." So they're Monday's up after. for at least twenty days, and it says indicates when they can be taken down at least and then you scratch after. out all the way till of the next sentence the first one two three four five words where it ends in a comma mm -hmm. and just put a capital T the story yes, polls yes, and then yes, shall exactly. be photographed good. right is that good yep. mm -hmm. and then on page two materials and methods number one where it has brightly colored woven plastic fencing or netting or flagging would be added in there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. Wait, sorry. It would be or flagging or it would be in place of the netting? Like instead of netting? I heard you Please. wanted to provide an Another option. Another option. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I think the netting, I mean, I don't know 100%, but I think the netting is what's causing the poles to kind of go in because you're, you're, the you're wind covering the wind. them. Yeah. But if you have two or three stories, then maybe it's okay. Right, like that. Right. Yeah. I'm okay so, with just sure. using flags. I don't know where everyone else stands on that, but I'm fine with that too. I'm, I'm comfortable just adding yeah. it as another option. Yeah. Yeah, that's if, if, if we're trying to get something that city council may consider, then I would add it. The option's option. fine. That's fine. Okay. 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 Yep. Um, closes the discussion on story polls, uh, commissioners' reports and comments. Um, 
Have any meetings? Council meetings. We had the last Here's one. Now. Where are we? January 22nd. January. Oh, you were here <laughs> next week. Oh. So, so, Roni, did you cover the I should seconds? probably look at this before. We, uh, uh -huh. we can talk about that one. We'll put that one on next week's agenda. The next, the next report time. back. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any potential future agenda items? Okay. We're adjourned.